What's up, guys? Thank you for joining us for another Home Theater Hangout. We got the whole crew tonight. We got Matthew Poe's audio extraordinaire, audiologist. I don't know what the proper term is. Don Dunn, and then Kellen from Dream Media. Whoa. Matt, that's Representing. Representing. What's up? What's up? All right. Topics tonight. I guess we're going to hit off the Florida Audio Expo first. Right there, Don and uh, Kellen. You guys were the t only two here to uh, to go check that out. What's that like? What was I missing by not going there this weekend? Yeah, Matt, last Matt weekend? Pose was on a secret mission. <laughs> it's in the Caribbean. I was supposed to be there and I was in the Caribbean instead. I, I, can't, I can't tell you I why. I would have easily traded places with you this week. <laughs> the show was that bad. Not no offense against Don, but uh, I don't know. The two channel show really wasn't my what would it have been definitely in the home theater style, but there was some cool stuff there for sure. With the uh, which like the best room that was there, right off the bat, just bam, what's the best? The best one, uh. I, t I mean, I texted Don this. I think the Borison Towers were um, very solid. I kind of went for a realistic um, approach. Like, I'll never afford some of the half a million, <laughs> $800,000 setup. So um, the Borison Towers, I think they were, what, nine grand for the pair? Super the solid. The bookshelves or the towers? The towers. <clears throat> They're, the towers are 11000 a pair. The the flagship bookshelves were a hundred thousand dollars a pair. Yeah, is that those, them right there. But uh, no, they're a brand new model, man. Here's so those so. Are the what do they make the bookshelf out of? To nope for a hundred thousand. Unobtainium. Apparently, they're they're nice looking. Yeah, so, let me very, check. Let me text looking. you a picture, Shane. Borison. So it's a it's a it's a new line that Borison's coming out with. That's going to be their entry level line. And it has a lot of trickle down technology. The, the cabinets is stunning, man. It's all carbon fibered out, and the drivers are crazy. They, they don't have surrounds on them, kind of like the you know B and W mid range driver they've used for a long time. Um, oh, and they used a big uh, magnetic ribbon as a tweeter. You've got mail. You got mail. <laughs> and then they had a room down the hall that had some cryo additions that were pretty interesting. The whole. All the metal and the innards of the speaker, everything except for the plastic was cryoed, uh, frozen, mm -hmm. to change the molecular structure and everything. Um, but it was, they were oh. really cool. I just sent you a picture, uh, Shane. Of what they do that were. with steel, like in knives. Um, I designed knives, and um, for for the knives in the series I've designed are all cryo cryogenically treated. It kind of changes the molecular structure of the metal a little bit. It works, yeah. dude. It makes it super tough if you do it right. Cryogenically treated. Let me see. Mm -hmm. So these were cryogenically treated speaker enclosures. I don't no, know. The, I don't know speaker, if the one of my cryo nine metal, yeah. but I know Damn. all the metal inside the speaker was. Gentleman was kind of hard to understand, but um, I tried to squeeze out as much as I could with. Uh, with the designer that was there for Borson. And then I know you guys, Don, that's what, that's the room I left you guys in Saturday. Yeah. yeah I don't know how I, much further you went, but I went, I went back to do some more listening the next day. Cause you know, we we're so busy shooting videos and trying to talk to people and cover stuff on, on Friday and Saturday. I had on Friday, I had all my sales staff from, from um, Haven smart and our director of marketing, so I went back Sunday and just did the listening on some ones that I really liked. And those, those Borisons are, they're bomb. They're supposed to send me a pair off the first, they, they just get ready to start making, manufacturing them. They're going to send me one of the first pair to review. I'm super stoked. Yeah, they look, they look uh, high quality. Look at that. Yeah. Oh, dude, they're, oh, those are unusual drivers. <clears throat> yeah. Their motor structure and, I uh, did. it's just crazy, like, shit from wakanda dude <laughs> just the technology they use and it's badass it's crazy so what do you want to you going to carry them is that what you're saying well, i don't know i'm going to review them look at those cables what kind of cables are those yeah yeah they had three or four i think it was three companies that they're associated with 
Um, Av- Avik. What was the other one? It was like uh, cables, streamers, DAX, amps, components, and then it was the actual speakers was Borson. So that was yeah, probably was- my favorite. And then... The designer was there, Michael Borison, who's amazing. Super cool, dude. And then what what was your favorite, Don, you think? Oh, man, dude. Um, All right. So really, 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 really liked the Perlis and setup. They really had it dialed in. Um, First time I've really got to hear them dialed in like that before, and it was pretty awesome. Actually, their step-down series, they had the LCRs, with like an MTM with their... Um, the R five M. What's that? The R five M. Yeah, it was it was in, in matching stands with a pair of their push pull ten inch subwoofers. So that setup's probably about just for the speakers and stands, probably like twelve grand. But dude, it it was pretty much. I mean, that was that was it. Was that one of the well, cheaper setups? It's on uh, the SVS. Had side. A pretty pretty fun setup. <laughs> it um. <laughs> Really? It's not crazy money. I mean, in our world, you know, um, I loved it. I thought those subs were probably the most musical subs I've ever heard in my life. These and ones what was here? cool is a buddy of mine, Gabe from Maximum AV, who's a local dealer here who sells per listen, um, was kind of running the sound. And I came and we're friends. And I came in there. I'm like, dude, can we, we put on some electronic music? He turned it up and up and up and up and up and up. And it did not compress at all. The tonality did not change at all. It was just, I mean that's rare in a speaker. Usually you, you turn up speakers and they start to they start to either compress um, or they or the tonality changes. It, it's just yeah, a different those, sound, just louder. But I'm telling you, these those subs really freed up the the music yeah, of yeah. those monitors. It was very very. It good. was dope, man. The, um, the Prilisen and, subs are really unusual compared to a lot of <laughs> others. It's not just, you know people know like the push pull design, but there's more to it sure. than that. The amplifier is actually really unique. The uh, there's a computer inside of it. A lot of modern subwoofers have some sort of computer processing, but it's like an actually pretty potent, like cell phone level computer processor in it that they use to monitor everything, power in, power out, power in from the wall, actually. Mm-hmm. And one of the things it does is the limiters are really sophisticated in this, and they actually adjust the the limiters um, relative to the incoming wall, wall power. So if the sub's output starts to cause wall sag or other things going on in that room are causing sag on the line in voltage. It actually low, it lowers the limiter. So you can't overdrive a Perlis and subwoofer. So one of the cool things is when you do turn it up like that, the sub doesn't really compress in the traditional sense. It doesn't distort. It just stops getting louder. It, right. it was phenomenal. I, I can't say enough good things that, that pre pro or excuse me, integrated amp. Kellen, you remember the brand? It was like 13 grand. It was pretty, pretty awesome. That was driving the Perlis and stuff? Yeah. Oh, gosh. No. It, it was pretty cool. I mean, listen, high-end audio shows, if you've never been to one, or <laughs> lots of hotel rooms crammed with all kinds of shit. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you get a lot of fringe companies that you've never heard of, upstart companies, companies that are making I mean, a lot of snake oil. Let's just be honest. I mean, but, you know, power converters and grounding systems and every time it kind of cable – any kind of little bars that go up that hover they're supposed to i mean all kinds of just craziness so um and to be fair it's hard to take a hotel room and make system sound good especially if you've got larger speakers in a small room like that it's just really hard to to get them dialed in but man it, there's a lot of really good gear there i mean there was vandersteins that cost you know as much as a house and tube amplifiers i would i would say if you're if i had to pin it down the best sounds that I heard were the Perlis and the Borisons that, that I just texted you, Shane, a picture of them. Their new series for 11 grand a pair were amazing. And um, this upstart company, um, Aratai um, yeah, Audio, sure. that was one of the first ones that we went to, right, Kellen? Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, unfortunately, because we had to keep going back to that room to make sure our ears weren't <laughs> like... And yeah, dude, listen, they, really they, good, really they, early. He's got these speakers that uh, they had the bookshelves, right? They're yeah. nine grand a pair. And they're, you know, fairly unorthodox looking and they got a pretty big waveguide. You can get it in wood or, or whatever. It's actually made out of wood. Um, a ring, a unique ring radiator tweeter, a six and a half in the front and a six and a half in the back, um, all sealed, but two separate chambers for the drivers. 
And I mean, everybody that came in that room swore there was a subwoofer in there. Like really? people were actually, were you with me, Kelly, when those, those two Asian guys were looking underneath it? And every yeah. time I went there, it was like trying to lift in the skirt. You know what I mean? Were they desktop but, uh, speakers? Yeah, I, I actually have those in, in my garage. I haven't hooked them up yet. Um, I won't give you my address. They're expensive. But man, they sounded, <laughs> that was probably, the, those three were kind of a tie. I would wow. say if I had to pick a per listen, just because I had the subs and we got to turn it up loud and hear the volume, but as far as actual clarity and sound and detail, sound stage, just a full richness to the sound, th those three really kind of captured my heart. It goes down at 32 hertz to 30K. Look at that. I mean, it's, it's impressive. It's, yeah. It's, it's an impressive speaker to hear it. So, Matt, I want you to measure the speaker for me, if you don't mind. I will. I'm actually really curious. I mean, it's a, it's a interesting it, looking design. Well, so the, been... the story's cool. Um, Giannis, the, the founder of the company, telling you one of the nicest human beings you'll ever meet in your life, man. Great dude, super well read. But um, he got into hi fi and he was a you know musician and um, he's a IT guy and and just said, man, dug, dug into books, read all Floyd tool stuff, all kinds of books and measurements and whatnot, and just started working on um, a speaker that would work good in a room in his own interpretation of it. So, mm -hmm. so he's got two towers as well. He's got the middle speakers, a tower, um, real efficient, 25 dBs, it's 25 grand. So 25 it's a, dB. But he said that one of his things, yeah, the Contra 200, um, one of the things that he said is he wanted his speakers to be able to play loud and clean, um, you know, and not compress. And, and I certainly got that sense. What about you, Kellen? Yeah. Um, yeah, he, those were, those were awesome. I think him playing a variety of music. I think that was what hurt me at the show was a lot of music that I don't know. It's Melly Cat. Yeah. So, Some of you is fourth in G minor. We're going to turn yeah. it to about 50 dBs. You hear it? Like, yeah. yeah like, so that, that was the problem. That's kind of what ruined it for me for most of the rooms. Um, some of the rooms weren't big enough. I think the Focal Maestro Utopias that were there. Oh, I mean, yeah, there God. No was... way those speakers they still sounded really great. Stretch their legs at all. But, um, yeah, the Aratides were awesome. Uh, Giannis, cool guy, great story. I mean, just locked up in his house during COVID, he said, and just went to work. Find a speaker that he liked to listen to music on so he decided to make his own so that's pretty cool from latvia baltic state you know that's i've never heard any audio from latvia you what guys you carry drink? this right what beer this is hyphavizen liquor uh, yeah. This yeah this is iced tea i don't i don't drink while i'm on here yeah well, live streams. I just, liar <laughs> so kellen you guys, you guys carry this right yes yeah we are focal name dealer this looks so dope. This is like my end. This is my grail speaker right here. If I could, yeah, they're dope. I actually got to hear those, man. Yeah, yeah, like in legit you, you space. You want to flex with those? Just have them in the yeah. background all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. put in my yeah, office here. Not even have them hooked up. In and <laughs> they're one back they're there. ginormous. They could bury you in that, Shane. Yeah, I've seen that. I've seen some videos. You guys, yo, Kellen, you guys didn't do a video on these, have you? Uh, I think Zach had done a video. I mean, because. Their grand utopias, the maestro utopias. I mean, they've been around for a while. Yeah. Um, yeah. Zach, I think Zach did a video on them, Expona, gosh, maybe four years ago. Um, I mean, we've never set one up for a client. So, <laughs> but uh, there's a first for everything, I guess. Well, we went and covered the yeah, opening yeah. of the Focal Powered by Name store in Miami for Audioholics. We went down there really? for a day, and that was the thing. they had every single Focal product. Everything. I must, I must have missed that video. Did you guys post it? Yeah, we posted a while back. Was it? Mm -hmm. I don't recall. I'm pretty sure that got posted. Yeah, yeah. So somebody's asking Actually, about the room where the Grand Utopias were. It was a little small, but still sounded great. I mean, they had the name reference set amp and preamp setups. The 300 grand they had at the audio show as well. Looks like a space heater. It's crazy. The uh, Focal or the the name the name the master statement. Every time I've ever heard those Grand yeah. Utopias, they've had them in a room that was too small for them. Well, dude, it's hard to find. Them for I know, them. but be nice to yeah. hear them stretch their legs. The, the audio room. show they they had uh, which Utopias did they have? Killing you have better memory. The uh, Maestros. Maestros, yeah, they were they were beautiful. <clears throat> They're and, about and, what five and a half foot tall, I think. 
Oh, not that much. Maybe five. Not even five. They're pretty tall, but not that tall. My speakers are five, so Joey wasn't completely. She was a little bit above those. So that's my point of reference. Hey, to answer your question, Don, it was the Audio Flight. That was okay. the all in one. Oh, Audio uh, Flight. Yep. That's There's a really John. good. That's Our boy really John. Good right Johnny's here. John Johnny, said he, top gun. John said he'll trade in his uh, Sopras for a pair of uh, Utopias. Kellen. Man, I still love Sopras, though, John. That, in that red color you got. They had them in that orange, which was cool. But that yeah. a Sopra 3 in that Ferrari red, dude, is about as dope as the speaker's going to look, I think. And things are wicked. Kellen, I want you to send me some Diablos. That's what I want. <laughs> I'll see what I can do. Diablo. <laughs> yes. Because those uh, Sopra 1s are so Diablo, badass. How are going to send you Diablos? They're small. They're not even that expensive. They're like, what, 15 grand? Big enough. Yeah, they're, they're 20, what, 20, 24, 26 grand? Yeah, what, I mean, what's expensive? <laughs> for bookshelves? But the Borensons were 100 grand for bookshelves. That oh, is really? Dead. Oh, dude, come on, dude. Dude, dude I'm of... telling you, bro. You ain't never, you ain't never heard no bookshelves like these, though. The cryos were, I think, 42. Yeah, but the ones in the right hand side. Also insane, yeah. but the the towers I thought was reasonable for the delivery and presence that they gave in that room. <laughs> Samsung Atmos sound bars. <laughs> was there any sound bars at the uh, any I mean, sound call bars? my cousin Billy and his was there any sound bars? There? One, he'd tell you. No. SVS was close. I mean, their, 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 their setup was... Two SB three thousands, uh, ultra center channel, prime pinnacles, elevations, and prime bookshelves. Their their whole thing was their whole setup was less than fifty eight hundred bucks. Yeah, they brought they brought a lot of sound sound bar. So I, I it's talked a lot to you um, less than an audio quest cable tonight at SVS, and he said that the owner of the show said that y'all brought in sixty percent of the people, which might be true because. <laughs> <laughs> really you buy a cable there that costs more than a whole system yeah yeah I, they made a big deal about wanting to get in more companies like that i was talking to the the team that was putting the show on the other thing that has come up is actually doing home theater in a future year if they get mm -hmm. they can't do it in that hotel because it's too small but if they move to a larger hotel hmm. being able to do some surround rooms the problem is i mean kellen you you kind of understand this given what you what you do a lot of the manufacturers that sell surround oriented gear have trouble seeing the return on investment in setting up a whole surround setup at one of those shows. Cause it means renting typically the largest room they have. So you're paying four or five times more for your room. It means bringing in extra crew. It's not like one or two people, but you need enough people to help set up a whole surround system, get it going. And now it's not like a couple of speakers, some cables and wire, or cables and wire cables and an integrated amp. Now you're talking about like a Trinoff processor, 16 channel amplifier, you know, all the speakers rigging to put them in place. Cause obviously a hotel room isn't designed to handle a full surround system. So you've got to get something to mount it to. Usually they bring the black curtains. Yeah. I mean, but it was kind of, but it was like, as basic it was as they could clever. do. They took a two by four, a real long one all the way up close to the ceiling and they mounted their angled speakers on it. They did a pretty good job. Yeah. I mean, they were running it with like a $500 Denon. So. Yeah. But the higher end companies, I think have, have argued that it's not worth their time to do it, which I think is too bad because I think those are better demos. I actually really enjoy the surround yeah, demos. Music. Oh. Yeah. I mean, Emotiva has done it at Expona. Jeff actually JTR and then with the integrator line RTJ, he did it for years at Axphone. I don't know if he's doing it anymore. It's a lot of work. Uh, Mark Seaton used to do one right next to him. Same thing. We got to book our reservations for Axphone. Yeah, I need to go. <laughs> After missing this show, I think I should probably go to Axphone. <clears throat> That's why I don't go to those shows. Those guys are so douchey. Every time I go to the New York audio show, there's kind of douchebags, so I'll stop going. No, SVS is cool. They make good products. I mean, I got a well, yeah, stuff they're in like, my bedroom. Yeah, they're that, for the normal out. folks. Yeah, those guys are always nice. So it's just like some of the uh, the cord, like those guys from cord. They're kind of douchers. <laughs> guys from cord are douchers. Yeah. Speaking of oh, the subs, <laughs> <laughs> nah, they sounded good. I like I like SVS quite a bit actually. No, yeah, SV, I mean, I think it was the busiest room. Anytime you walk by there, there was. It doesn't shock me. So you know what we're gonna get is their new uh, architectural sub. They make a oh, in wall. Right? or in ceiling dual nine inch sub yeah. it has the same outboard amplifier that's in the sb3000 
And if you buy it in a set with two subs, they actually change the impedance on the subs and do a couple things to it, which is pretty cool. I was talking to them tonight. Nick? I've been curious how good that is. You know, in-wall, good. Well, we're going to try it out. So I'll, I'll be curious. Good in-wall subs are, are hard to are find. Hard to find. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's my world. I mean, we do our bread and butter. I, for every box sub that we sell, we probably sell three to four um, individual or sets. I usually try to do a set of architectural subs. And just to be really brutally honest with all the manufacturers, 90% of them are just okay at best. You know what I mean? Until yeah. you get the JL Audio. JL Audio is a is a real yeah. sub, but I mean, it's I a think very it's challenging. You can't retrofit that particular product. It's got to be something that you design. Well, you up could around. with drywall damage and all that, but it's wow. very difficult. So the SVS all comes with a built in back box and a pre construction bracket for new construction, or you can cut it out for a retrofit. Granted that your studs are even, which is a problem that we run into a lot. But what they're claiming is this give, is given substantial output, like. You know, and if you locate it where it can load off of a surface, it's really going to uh, expedite that and make it make it a lot, you know, more intense. I'm I'm excited to check them out, Matt. I told them, you know, we'd have you measure them, and we don't have to mount them in the wall because they have a back box. If it's got a back box, I can measure it as yeah. is. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. So I, w- I wonder if it's, it's better than the retail. Deftex I have. What's that? So I wonder if it's better than Deftex I have. Probably. It's smaller, but it's you know. Gotta be. We'll see. You've got you got Def Tech in walls in your home in your Pro Listen home theater. No, I have Def, I have no, Def no. Tech in walls in my family room. <laughs> no. <laughs> He's got big bada boom. The no, there's there's much more silver in the, in the oh, Pro so Listen are home you, theater. Are you running for subs? Are you doing all Pro Listen, or do you do something else for subs? Uh, so the back of my room, I've got these. Uh, they're actually from RBH, so it's the same kind of sub like Gene has, but it's an in wall version. So it's the same twelve inch driver that. That they use in their reference subwoofers, what which is a good driver. Dual 12s or single 12? It's a dual 12. So there's two of the dual 12 modules. So it's basically equal to oh. each each dual 12 is equal to 118, basically. So there's the equivalent of two 18s in the wall yeah. in the back of the room. And they're not, when I say in-wall, these are not like in-wall subs. They're, they're actually designed to go into the floor or ceiling. They're like nine inches deep. And they're about four feet, five feet tall, something like that. And it's also not something you can retrofit. And Don will tell you, I came up with a special mount for them so that they're all decoupled. I mean, the walls themselves are decoupled, but these are decoupled from the decoupled walls to avoid excess vibrations. Um, this same sub was tested a while back uh, and it, it, you know, in the deep base, it's not going to be super great because it is a sealed sub, but in the upper base range, it was like high one twenties. So it's got pretty good output. Yeah. And then the rest, I kind of make a good sub. Does Prolissa even have in wall subs or no? They're coming. They don't have them right now, but that's a, a future product that they'll release. And I'm sure they'll be really good. They'll yeah. probably be expensive, but they'll be well made. And um, I think they're really trying to compete more for the, the high end integrator line anyway. So they're probably going to be a higher output product. And I know Dan shared it's it's really hard to get high output in a three and a half inch deep yeah. you know, wall area. So a lot of it is sometimes you just say, well, we're just not even going to do that. Like that's what RBH did. They've got the a JL audio package. makes these boxes are like six foot tall to, well, in order to do the that. driver though i mean how do you get a driver that can give you 15 20 25 millimeters of excursion but in something that's three and a half less than three and you're like three inches deep or something it's just hard jail's got really funky especially engineered drivers but a lot of other companies the drivers are just so 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 you got so, a couple 18s too right matt in the front I do. Uh, and then I got a call from Jeff actually today saying, well, you want to maybe put in the RTJ 18s up front instead. So I had been talking about doing the Perlison D215, which I still may do. But I like Jeff's subs. I can subs give you a glowing a recommendation for the RTJs. Yeah, I know. And I've measured it. It's a really good <laughs> sub. I mean, the distortion, it's actually the only subwoofer we've ever measured that had distortion that was about as low as the Perlison. And it's doing it without the push pull. So it seems to be a pretty darn good uh are you going to at least get a 24 or a 32 in there? I mean, I feel like I need to. I feel like I need to, too. <laughs> in that little room, that would be awesome. In that little room, yes. The well, little, you're going to put one in your little room. <laughs> yeah. On the, it's actually in shipping right now. So I'm pretty really? I'm you're getting a 20, test you are getting 24. Yeah. He, they're doing a 24. I'm hoping to, if you don't mind, Don, I'd like to take that to the parking no, lot. No, I'm just going to. I'd not like to take it to the parking lot. 
well, it's going to go in my new showroom, but uh, I was going to come check it out. You know what I mean? Just to make sure it's okay. Um, yeah, Matt, I'll, we'll get that one to you. You just have to help me get it. No, I don't. Yeah. You don't have to get it to me. We'll take it over to the shop where it's going. Take it into the parking <clears> lot there, and I'll just measure, measure it right it. there. We'll annoy the crap um, out of your neighbors for half an hour and be done. How do you even do that? that? Isn't it noisy outside? It's like windy and all that. Like, how's, how do you get an accurate reading? Well, it really, really low frequencies that can be challenging. And then you just try to pick a time of day when it's not too bad. I actually haven't been to the showroom yet. So this may not be a good idea. His showroom it's may be too pretty, noisy. It's not bad. It's not, not bad. bad. All right. But so, um, the subwoofer uh, typically is loud enough that when you're measuring it just like one meter from the subwoofer, the signal to noise ratio in that burst test you're doing is good enough that it doesn't really matter and you get a perfectly accurate test. So usually 20 hertz and above on anything with with decently high output, you can measure no problem. And you can tell when it's a bad measurement. So it's not like it's going to give you some really high number and it's all garbage. Like you can just see that the waveform is screwed up and you've gotten a bad measurement. So we usually know when we're getting a good one or a bad one. It's usually the opposite. It's that it constantly fails because it's too noisy. Yeah. And so, so we would know, and then we just wouldn't give a result for that. We would say like the ambient noise was too high to do a, you know, a valid test at 12 Hertz or whatever. But I have to imagine that the Ascendo 24 inch subwoofer is going to have pretty serious <laughs> output at, at uh, 12 Hertz. I think on the specs, it's like uh, 118 dB at 20 Hertz or something. It's insane. I mean, it's definitely on the low side though. I don't, I mean, there's, probably a few subs that can keep up with it. I know Meyer sound makes an infrasonic now and a couple of companies do, but it's going to be a monster. Giant. They're, they're sending me a pair of their ported 12s too to test. Who, Meyer sound? No, a, a Cinda. I think the thing that I, I, I kind of am curious where the number comes from in terms of whether it's right or not, just because it's such a high number, but the X max numbers that they give for their, subwoofers is are mm -hmm. really high like they're higher than anything i've seen on any anybody else's subs the mm -hmm. highest i'm familiar with that typically in production subs is like 36 to 38 mm -hmm. millimeters and i think they spec theirs at like 45 something like that they probably have, even the smaller ones well no i think it's those yeah, infrasonic. those infrasonic subs yeah but they probably have to be it's just hard to get a voice coil you know, like there's just not a lot of companies that make subwoofers of voice coils that long and motors that can handle yeah. it and everything. So it's yeah, just made a lot of design. Place. Yeah, they're German. Or Asian. German. Sure. Well, companies German, they probably have their drivers made overseas. I would assume that those drivers are custom. I would assume they're making well, I those saw drivers. 80, he sent me a picture of it before it came out. Yeah. <clears throat> we had like nine Asian people trying to move it side. It looked like Asian That's true. Drivers. I do. I saw that picture too. <laughs> they look really small next to that. Idiot, so let me guess you probably need about two way guys in the movie, right? <laughs> no, well, I, I, it's probably made in Asia. I, I think it'd probably take 12 white guys to move it. I think, <laughs> probably, man, we always gotta go there, dude. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that, yeah. We're only about two beers in right now. She <laughs> is woke. Woke let me ask you, yo, every time I look at a dream media video, I don't know where you guys are from, you guys all live in like gigantic mansions. What what is going on in these houses over there? Look at this theater, dude. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> I know. Look how high that ceiling You're looks. Talking lots of dollars. <laughs> He's got twenty uh, foot ceilings. What are you talking about? That's normal, right? Yeah, eighteen foot. No. Uh, <laughs> You're close. My house is not that big. Uh, I saw you walk out of that theater room. You walked around it. I was like, look. I was like, why is your hallway so high? And then you were like, there's a the place for your. I don't know, you were exhausting out or something like that. And I was just like, yo, look at this guy's little hallway. There was like a little tricycle. Yeah. Like, this, is a, this is huge. Oh, this in the, the version two of this room, it's actually mm -hmm. going to be, uh, projector's going to be shooting through the wall. So I'll kind of get rid of the big bulky projector cabinet. And then everything's going to be behind stretch fabric, a lot cleaner. Uh, Kelly, tell them what you're putting in there, man. Come on. I can't. <laughs> don't. Oh, you can't. You got a Barco. Still, Barco still. or an Eclipse? Uh, oh, you can't tell me. Okay. 300 inch of fuel. No. Um, I, <laughs> I think an Eclipse would mean an extension to the house. Everybody will <laughs> know, uh, I would assume, in the next two or three weeks. Yeah. Oh, you can't say that until you. I didn't know. We should have signed the NDA. I'm going <laughs> to totally, I'm totally fuck you right now. But. 
It's not. Uh, it's big and powerful. Let's put it that way. Yeah, at at the main listening position, I'll be 123 dB. That should be barely adequate. Mm. <laughs> should call youth man. He likes that shit. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I mean, from what I heard while I was touring um, their facilities was extremely impressive. Um, so we'll see. I'll be I'll be anxious to see <clears throat> how it listens in my room, but because mm. I heard it in a huge like auditorium, and um, I think one of the most impressive demos that I've ever heard was there. They had these speakers that were the X twenties. They're like the size. It's a little bit bigger than a loaf of bread, but they had who makes that speaker. A company called Meyer Sound. Oh, okay. All right. I never, never heard so, of it. So um, they had, they were just doing like a 2.1, but they had a, yeah, mm-hmm. left and right. And then they had their 212. And it's just two twelves. And man, that sub was rocking this. I don't know. Had to have been 50, 60 by 120 <laughs> foot deep room with like 20 foot ceilings, 25 foot ceilings. And it was just loud as can be. It was crazy. And then you go into a room that's a lot smaller than mine, and it's got three blue mm-hmm. horns, and those are ex- extremely powerful. And then you were listening to, um, yeah, that's their infrasonic. Um, yeah, those, <laughs> those were made. Those peace, yeah. Thump and thunder, <laughs> they'll feel it in their bones. <laughs> those were made for Metallica to go on tour. So from made from Metallica, but they now go into home theaters instead. They can, yeah. Metallica, best band on the planet. So we, we got to hang out with um, Aaron from Aaron's Audio Corner. We got to hang out and have dinner and come back to my place, do some listening, hang out. It was pretty cool. What you guys listen to? Pretty rad, dude. Listened on your uh, Kentus? We listen to all kinds of stuff. You know, uh, Kellen's very familiar with the Kentus. Do you think there's a sound difference between Kentus 1, 2, and 3? I've not heard the threes, so I cannot oh, well, be honest I, there. I must be the only one. They're, they're a little bright. <laughs> no, they're not a little bright. They're very bright. You need to get the threes in. Maybe you had a bad batch. I don't know, man. I mean, but well, the odds be getting into two, the ones, two of the twos. them. My twos aren't. The bright. ones that are in twos are awesome. The threes were like stupid bright. I mean, disgusting. After bright. after hearing everything, I mean, I I think honestly, for my ears, I prefer something a little brighter. And that has that just like crisp uh, that Don uh, used over the weekend. I think there there was a lot of speakers that were that had that clarity and everything, but they just were missing that. <laughs> Is clarity that nice way of saying they were too bright? Do what? Is clarity What's just that? a nice way of saying too bright? No. No. I don't think anything of mine was too bright. No, I don't think so. I think the, huh. I think the RBHs were. Um, that was my first time hearing those as well. I think those were impressive, um, powerful. Yeah. But um, which which ones? The Gene ones? No, I have the passive version of Genes. Hmm. The half stack, which I mean, I don't have the top two subs, but I've got the bottom two with the dual twelves with the eighteen hundred watts each going to those. And I have four RTJ 18s with that too. So it's it's a lot of bass. But dialed in. Accurate. It's toy, toy like a tiger. What did Aaron think, by the way? Don. Don. Well, yeah, I mean, what do you think, Kellen? <laughs> I think you fucking loved him, man, to be honest with you. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I was trying to, we were trying to dig it out of him. I mean, I don't know how. He had a big ass smile on his face. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't know how you couldn't be impressed, but... Um... It's an absurd amount of bass. Yeah. For the RBHs. Well, he's got more than RBHs. He's got the RBH dual 12s, but then he's also got the four 18. 18s from uh, RTJ. Oh, like, your place, Don. Why do I feel like Matt's mic sounds better than mine? 
Then I'm going to put the 24 in there. I sound better than you. What's going on? Why does your mic sound better than mine? <laughs> <laughs> like everything That's... I own, I bought because you told me that was the thing to buy. To get this out. <laughs> <clears throat> he did. Shane's our, Shane's our point of reference. We won't lie on, on the broadcasting. Obviously, he's the kingpin. He does a good job. He does a great job. His videos are great. I mean, Can we take a minute to appreciate Don Don's of... Tom Berenger canvas? Uh, <laughs> Is that Tom Berenger back there? Yeah. Bond. I got all kinds of shit in here. I just, you know, put it in other areas. So all right, we took a minute for that one. By the way, somebody keeps asking about the paradigm, the new XR sub. Oh yeah, the XR. Was yeah. that there at the show? Did you get I'm curious. You didn't nope. see it? So we've been trying to get one of those to review. I, I think because I'm getting other products from them, so I think it's just an issue of uh, availability maybe to get those out. I've been trying is for that three a years. Big monster sub, Matt, or is it one with like a bunch of eights in it, like they've had before? No, I think this is a like a thirteen-inch driver or something yeah. like that. But it's got a lot of excursion. It's a very unusual-looking driver. It's got spiders on on the ends of the voice coil instead of like the normal place you'd see them to, to give it more. I'm assuming more control, like reduce rocking. But um, the claim is it's like a hundred millimeters of excursion. Somebody put in there. I mean, it's the claim is ridiculous. If, if it's true, Fair I don't know. Good subs, man. They'd be good at everything, but they, yeah, they no, just, rock but sub. We, we may actually hit up Gabe if he's open to it and just test it outside of show. Yeah, he totally would be cool with that. He's got one, yeah, so we, we could just we go hung over there out and do a little it. bit at the show this weekend. Get they got a hellacious showroom over there, man. We could go over there uh -huh. and test. And is that shoot the videos or whatever? XR11. Oh, maybe that's what it is. Yeah. I don't Underwhelming know. Underwhelming demo. Hmm. Gabe claims that this new XR sub kills the Perlis and D215. And well, he right. likes to Gabe, post Gabe has paradigm tattooed on his ass, dude. No yeah. offense, Gabe, but you love paradigm. He's the best big. But it's hard to argue the point with paradigm. They make it top to bottom. They make a great product line, man. That's it. I mean, it's an attractive looking sub. I give it that. If they have a picture of the driver, it's a pretty ridiculous looking driver. Only four grand. That's a deal. Yeah. Let me see. Let's You've seen the here. drivers in their Persona series? Oh, hold on. That's XR11. Here's the XR13. That's the yeah, one. I think that's the one I was thinking of. So I yeah. guess there's two. I didn't even know there was two sizes. Should probably pay <clears> attention. <throat> the pictures. I don't see anything else. 12 hertz. Wow. Impressive. 17 hertz, 40 hertz. Cool. 13 inch. Just a single 13. You know, yeah, I mean, I, I can't jail. imagine it's got anywhere near the output of the D215, but yeah, Gabe Wait, seems who said to that? like it better. Better than D215s? He, that's what 15s? he claims. He specifically, no, he specifically seems to think that there's something wrong with the D215 design. What? You guys smoking crack? That's I've like heard the best demos I've heard. of it. I haven't had it in my own room, but you've had it in your own room. and That was right? the best thing ever, yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. Have you had any JLs, man? Because everybody... Like all this talk about other subs and nobody really talks about JL. Is it because they're so expensive? It's because they what. stop. They they just need to make a they need to make a new look to it and then call it all exactly. brand new and then they'll be cool again. Oh, that they stop like is. innovating, right? They stop. There's like no nothing new that they've come out with like, like a decade. Subs are, JL subs rock. Like, they're very good subs, but I think nobody. That, <laughs> I think nobody talks about them because the design is like yeah. twenty years old at this point, and so it's just because it hasn't changed in forever. People There's just a kind of lost why interest. A new phone every year. It keeps people's interest. We have yeah. an attention mm -hmm. span of a flea. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the what is it called? The Goliath. The, I mean, those still look pretty, pretty badass. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the dual thirteen looking. and a half. That's a. The thing weighs like four hundred pounds. It's but it's twenty twenty two twenty three grand. I'm I mean, sure. Look, dude, honestly, for fifteen thousand dollars, you could buy the four RTJ 18s with the amp, like I have, that will just absolutely pick that jail up and crush it. I mean, yeah. it's just it's nine day, you know. Or if you want real infrasonics, just go for the Ascendos instead of that brand you just mentioned. So, I would probably just do that. I, That's what you'll do. You know, personally, a lot of great subs, man. You know, everybody's competing for what's the best sub. I mean, there's so many good ones. It's, that's in a so lot of cases, it's yeah. system and room dependent to, you know, like the stuff from Ascendo, the stuff from uh, from Jeff, even from RTJ works in a dedicated theater well, but the finish on them isn't going to make a lot of sense in yeah. a typical family room. Right. So whereas something mm. like the JL, that's a beautifully finished product. You could put that on display. My family room looks like a nightclub. You're well, cool. uh, 
I'm doing a new projector reviews. You know, this is what I wanted to ask Kellen. You know, why, don't, why don't you guys do like a projector shootout, like an official one when the new models come out? You should, guys should do something like that. We, man, we have been so busy behind the scenes, just like with a lot of stuff going on. Um, but we, we want to get involved with something like that. Um, we don't really have a solid relationship with Sony. I mean, we, we just, we just don't, um, they didn't really like our business model with shipping throughout the you know country and everything. So we just, I mean, we're not Sony dealers. Um, so everything comes, always comes off like, mm-hmm. you know, that's why we push because we can't deal Sony. I mean, Sony made great projectors, um, you know, what, five, six years ago, I think they were, it was close when now with the new ones, I mean, with everything going laser, I think JVC just has, you know, what everyone talks about, um, contract black levels. Um, when you, when you, when you finally have enough brightness on screen, now you can start picking things apart like that. Like, well, it's bright enough finally. So which one has, you know, greater, um, contrast, what has the lower black levels, um, the tone mapping has a ton to do with that when viewing HDR. Mm-hmm. And so we want to, for sure. Yeah. I think the next generation, you should do that. Cause I know, I know people that deal with Sony that I'm pretty sure wouldn't mind bringing a Sony unit over Donald. Yeah. So, uh, you know, JC, Sony, I Epson. Mean, they're all pretty close, man. I yeah. think, I mean, in that, at that, at that yeah. point, Sony's reliable. They work good. And it's just, I mean, as a Sony dealer, we have certain numbers we need to hit and it's not a mistake to buy a Sony. Although I absolutely love JVC. I think the new JV stuff, JVC products are the bomb. You know, they're, they're both very good. You would be, yeah. you know, well taken care of with either or. I've heard yeah. some really good things about the new Sony's. Like I've been a JVC guy forever. It's what I have in my own system. It's what I generally push <clears throat> a couple of dealers that I trust really well who had done some back-to-back comparison to themselves had been big JVC guys it told me like, you got to look at the Sony stuff. It's really improved. Some of the things that I had always held true, like contrast, they were saying that the, at least at the top of the line level, the top JVC against the top Sony, they said the new top Sony actually is pretty comparable in black levels, but actually beat it in some other ways. And so they yeah. were like, they liked the Sony better. I was like, you got to be kidding me. That's never been the case. JVC has always had better black levels. Sony's always had color gradation and banding in every single model since. Tell you what does look good. It's 2016 until now. (laughs) Their flagship. That thing. I haven't seen it yet. Absolutely horrible from experience. But what? Color banding. Seeing the Sony had color banding. Polarization. Whatever. I've I had I've reviewed it. I reviewed that. I've had it in my house. Three eighty. The seven thousand. It's only three eighty. Wasn't that last year's? Oh, no, oh, I haven't no. seen that one. I'm talking about the, the regular consumer ones, the, oh. normal, the normal people ones. Oh. Yeah, the normal people ones. With the yeah. 7,000 is, the, is that the one that's over 20 grand? <laughs> I don't, I don't I remember the model anymore. Yeah, it's like 30, 28 or 30. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you thought it had color banding issues? Yes. Yep, 100%. I took I it over to, uh, I was looking at, at value in, in, in his showroom. I was like, hey, he was like, oh, it's such a beautiful, beautiful projector, beautiful. I was like, yeah. I was like, did you see the color branding on it? He goes, no. He goes, no color branding. I was like, let me put on the little demo. He goes, oh, maybe that's something wrong with the projector. I was like, on your projector and the one I have in my house? He goes, oh, God, I should bring that up to the engineers. I was like, I'm pretty sure they know about it. It's been here for like fucking six years now. I'm like, come on. So I automatically discount their projectors every year until they get that fixed. JVC wins every time. Yeah, that's good to know. Yeah, so don't. I'm so I can keep recommending JVC. You're saying. Yeah, yeah. Keep, I don't keep need going to worry with the about the Sony. Yeah. yeah, I I think either way you can't go wrong, but except for that, except for yeah. that, apparently apparently you can go wrong. <laughs> Shane's saying big deal. That's a yeah. huge right. deal. Shane, yeah, <laughs> talk me into it. JVC is the way to go, guys. <laughs> you know yeah. what I didn't think was going to be a big difference was Don. Where's your camera? You, did you charge your phone? It's the uh, <laughs> charge your phone. <laughs> is the uh, the NZ eight to the nine the lens the sixty mil compared to the hundred mil? Is mm-hmm. what a big difference! I didn't think it would be that big of a difference. 
Like the detail is so much better on the nine. Yeah. I mean, well, I... the, the nine has matched parts, doesn't it? So like, isn't there a few uh, different elements to that design that would improve sharpness? That lens is like. That. No, um, the only difference between the NZ8 and NZ9 or 3100 and 4100 is the lens. The, the lens the, is it? It's the four-way optical block. So it's the it's the four-way EK, or I'm sorry, four-way 8K E-shift, where the 2100 only has a two-way 8K E-shift. Um, yeah, that, that's literally the only difference between the two is the, uh, the optical block is the same. Um everything's the same other than the larger lens that allows more light to give you that actual brightness contrast yeah the at the projector shootout that at value electronics they had a, a spears and munsell disc they were showing a building it was like a tower with like um like a little water tower or something like that and you could see the little rungs on the ladder or whatever um you can make out all the detail in those little in between the ladders the steps it was blurry on the eight but like super crisp on the nine. I was like, oh my God. I was like, what What a huge difference that was. Man, every eight in the room, I just think that you can, I turn that, I turn the E shift off. I think it does soften the image a little bit. I've, it does soften the image heard, 100%. I've yeah. heard both things. I mean, I've heard, you know, Chris Deering, he leaves it on. And I've heard other no, people leave it off. You can see uh, if you put on a Zack Snyder movie, that's heavily grain, like 300 or BVS. So you turn it on and off. Yeah, it smooths out the grain. It doesn't eliminate it, but it softens it for sure. Yeah. Um, and then some. I'll, sometimes I'll put it on if I'm watching like streaming. I can see slight, a slight sharpness like streaming movies. You have to and tell then, me what you do whenever you get the Mad VR. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah gonna, I when out. you get that Mad yeah. VR scene, I'll be super, super interested to hear yeah. your opinion on it. As boring as projectors are, that fascinates me a little bit. So, um, Thank you for the super chat, Michael Walker. My question about switching video sources using HDMI on AVR. Because in 20, 2005, you need proprietary Crestron cable and equipment to switch HD video. Well, so Crestron makes automation products, Michael. Has nothing really to do with HDMI. They do make an HDI video distribution system. You used to have to use Crestron cable to wire a Crestron system like Crestcat, Crestnet, but nothing really to do with proprietary HDMI cables for Crestron. I'm not really sure, especially with an AVR, it wouldn't have anything to do with the Crestron. Again, it's a control system. It, was there like a Crestron cable in an AVR? Is that what he's saying? I think he's just saying that maybe it was necessary sure. back then to do the switching. Through the, maybe the Crestron would control the switching? Yeah, maybe well, if you had like a crush on system. Yeah, nowadays, but even in 2005, HDMI switching could be handled through any. I mean, any AVR had that built in. Yeah, I don't. It was pretty new. Yeah, the matrix switching would have been unique. Is unique still. You know, yeah, that's more of an product. Ha has made and still makes a very high end video distribution system that's pretty bulletproof. But technology's progressed. I mean, there's a lot of companies. We're uh, putting a system in. That is um, um, MOIP, they call it. It's uh, HD over IP. It's 10 gig. It will switch full bandwidth um, HD in all formats um, up to 330 feet. And it will also do tiling uh, up to 16 sources. So what, how that works, you know, might be doing a diatribe, but you don't know. <clears throat> let's listen. Switching, switching subjects. But it, let's it, hear how smart you, you sound. What's that? Let's hear how smart you sound because usually you're just like uh, going on. <laughs> I'm usually I'm sometimes. like what you're going on about nonsense sometimes most of the time I have to be technical all day long with my freaking clients because I actually do this for a living and and I sound what because I'm having a drink in my house at eleven o'clock at night you little prick we're gonna talk about technical so you want me I can get very technical at all aspects anyways this this they have encoders um and it goes to a, a proprietary network switch the one we're using is a twenty seven thousand dollar retail switch. Um, 10 gig and you have encoders and decoders on the other end and it will you, you take whatever amount of encoders that you want whether it be two three four five six ten thirty and then you have that goes out to the decoders on the other end and that will actually decode and, and convert it to hdmi the full bandwidth on the system it's really state-of-the-art super cool stuff it's what the future of video distribution is really going to be but i'll shut up what what brand is that don 
that's AV Pro Edge. AV Pro Edge, okay. But you could other guess that. make it. I think Atlone is coming out with it. Um, Just Add Power already has theirs out. They kind of pioneered that technology. Um, Binary through Snap has that as well. So I mean, these are several several companies are coming out with products for it. We just use AV Pro Edge. We have a great relationship with them, and they we feel they make the best video products on the market. Uh, do you agree with this, uh, Kellen? N NX8 is better than the NZ7, but the NZ8 is comparable uh, to the NX7. Say it again. NZ. I think he's saying N NX7 is better than an yeah, NZ7. NZ7. But the NZ8 has comparable specs, particularly contrast <coughs> specs. I mean, I think it's. I think it depends on what you're going for. Like, if you're trying to do a larger screen in a maybe a room that has ambient light. The NZ7 is going to be your better choice because it's going to be a brighter projector. Mm -hmm. um, the NX7 is going to have more contrast. It is a bulb. Um, if I mention to a customer most of the time that, hey, one of these is bulb and one of them is laser, that automatically defeats whichever one yeah. is a bulb. So yeah. I think I think it's situational. Um, in a dedicated space, I would say... Yes, the NX7 would probably perform better, but I think it is situational. Um, a lot of the times, it's 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 situational. Okay, so the NX NZ7 is better than the NX7. So Shane, have you seen pictures of Kellen's theater? I saw the video. Yeah. yeah. Did you? Okay, it's, it's huge. Super dope. Yeah, super huge. It's a big theater. I'm jealous. I need. I need to go. I was talking to my wife about this uh, not that long ago. Because after I saw your video, I went to like Zillow. And I was like, dude, I said, like, look at these guys' houses in Texas. Well, it's, What's going it, you on? You built it right here? onto the double wide. It's crazy. <laughs> Is that what you got going on? Yeah, yeah, he's from Beaver Lake, Kentucky. So <laughs> I got a covered garage attached to my double wide. <laughs> look at me. <laughs> That's all right. My mom. My mom was from Sulphur Well, or so. It's all right. But yeah, man. Um, hopefully, whenever we get the room buttoned up and finished, you, Don, Pose, you can come calibrate it. <laughs> <laughs> Matt gave him a pricey. He had a meltdown. <laughs> yeah. He's like, I saved uh, my like, two best like, notes Matt, for that one. I've already got your phone number, bro. Like, what? what is <laughs> this is true. But I, I think this is, hold on, I got to tell a little story. So, first time I ever talked to Kellen. I think Don had like put Kellen in touch with me or something. And he had said, Hey, we should work together on some stuff. I said, yeah, it'd be cool. And he goes, how does your pricing work? So I told him kind of the range of pricing for different kinds of services. And I said, you know, it's cause I work with, with Anthony Grimani. So at the upper end, it gets into PMI work and the pricing obviously shifts because there's a lot more that's involved. And he, he just, I, I, I don't even remember the number I told him, but it was for some kind of service. And he goes, people pay that. And I was like, well, we're pretty busy. So yes, people are paying that. I mean, <laughs> UPS brought a package there today and Matt charged him a dollar twenty five just to go to the door and answer it. So <laughs> that's funny. That's funny. <laughs> uh, I just do that to Gene. No, so Matt does super high level crazy not that yours isn't. I'm just saying he does a lot of like oh my god theaters. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it, for Anthony Cremani to want Matt to work with him is I can't imagine a, a better, you know, recommendation than that. In the industry, you know, I like it. GBA. I like it when um, Matt posts his videos and everybody questions him in his videos. I know <laughs> that's so funny. You guys have no idea how much that stresses me out at home. That my wife would be like, "What's going on? Somebody doesn't agree with me." <laughs> that's why I need to prove them wrong now. They don't. <laughs> They're like, "This guy doesn't know anything about audio, does he?" <laughs> he, he actually fucking knows everything about audio. That's the problem. <laughs> like, I, I'm not going to say any names, but he's looking at white papers and shit, going, "That's just wrong." And I can prove it. I'll tell you. I'm like, okay. And he does. <laughs> it's true. Like, what's uh, what's new over on Dream Media? What are what should we be looking? Well, hold on. How are those uh, new focales? What are they, Vestias or something like that? Vestias, um, good. I mean, price point, they're they're good. I'd like to hear them compared to the new Martin Logans. I would like to hear the new Martin Logans. Mm -hmm. Um. But the new uh, the new wave guy that they put on the Vestias, they're using the same tweeter that's in the 300 series and the um, Aria 
line and then they're no they're using it they said it was a tweeter from the car audio world well it's it's still aluminum magnesium okay different um same materials i guess on the tweeter okay but then the the waveguide is um some new m waveguide but i like them um they have i mean nothing really too new the batiste headphones have been out a while now they've got Um, a new outdoor line i actually am very excited about that new outdoor. we saw those at the show um those like giant pebbles look really cool yeah i'm supposed to be having some sent for review i mean that was the last and the new new martin logan's and yeah the new martin logan's i have the sony i'm I'm getting that sony dude i'm just telling you right now (laughs) i'm not supposed to keep that sony Bullshit. I mean, if they don't ask for it back, I guess, but that, I'm, I'm not Jean, supposed to keep that. Gene said, that Jean said that's yours. Uh, Gene told me I'm supposed to send that one back and that uh, maybe a new one would come later on. But that's mm. anyway, I just got to get it, bench test it, review it. I want to try them with the Martin Logan, see how it does. I mean, Shane, somebody asked about that actually. Like you had mentioned that people not necessarily taking Sony seriously for high end audio, but they Sony ES actually used to be a really yeah, big yeah. name in high end yeah, audio probably. and they kind of lost their way. Yeah, and what they're claiming is this is supposed to be a back to the roots kind of approach. So I'm really curious mm-hmm. if this receiver is is decent. New I gotta say, it's heavy. It is heavy. Yeah, I, I hurt so, myself carrying it inside. So o- over the years, Sony, when Sony wants to dominate audio, Sony makes some epic. Yeah, I've owned a couple of Sony products over the years that were just I, I forget the model number. I had a pre-pro um, with Dolby Digital back in 2001. 2000 or 2001, it was probably the best sounding pre pro I've ever had. They've had decent those, products over the years. Yeah. I remember those tower speakers they had. Do you remember those? I forget what they yeah, had. Yeah, yeah. A lot of them had a wedge um, shape. Yeah. The, the top ES ones had like scan speak drivers. They were designed oh, yeah, by a yeah. really talented 20 engineer. Grand a pair. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They were actually very decent. I, I bought a pair at, uh, I think it was called like Advantage Audio or something like that. In, uh, well, the high end Sony? You the high-end ones, yeah. Well, they were not. So what happened was they somebody had damaged. They were a display pair, and the, they had matching stands, and the stands had been damaged, and so they sold them as like a damaged pair for I don't remember, like seven hundred dollars or something. Really? Like the drivers were worth more than what they were selling them for. So I ended up buying those, fixing them so that they were functional, and yeah, they were good. Just didn't look that good anymore. No, but Yamaha can actually make really good speakers too when they want to. Do you I haven't heard that yet, but you may be right. Remember these? Oh, shoot. What happened to them? While you're looking that up, Shane, um, continuing off the Focal stuff, outdoor line. Yeah. Uh, I think I think something that they've missed that'll be huge for um, integrators and things for distributed audio in ceiling all weather speakers. That new Latora. Um, that line looks incredible and sounds sounds really good. They're using beryllium in that line, so um, it's not. Oh, I didn't realize that they're using beryllium in the tweeters for that line. Mm-hmm. So that's going to be a pretty high end in speaker then. Okay, wow. So they have a ten inch passive sub that you can install in ceiling, and then I forgot actually how big the um, speakers actually are, but I know they have a ten inch sub that can be retrofitted as well they have a yeah, 70 cool. volt commercial line too so vocal you know you get companies that kind of get hot for a while does that make yeah. sense over the years and you know kef's kind of hot right now and what they're making they're doing some really cool stuff right now focal is killing it from top yeah. to bottom i mean they it pretty much anything that you have of there sounds really good i mean we do mostly architectural we do tons of focal architectural even their 100 series as their entry level speaker still sounds better than a lot of companies higher end model of architectural speakers Tough to beat for 250 a speaker six and a half yeah yeah no, the reality really is good. a lot of architectural speakers aren't that good like now that i've actually started mm-hmm. to get to hear a lot you know even in my own house i'm really starting to realize that i think unfortunately there's a lot of not great architectural speakers out there tons yeah it's, it's i mean there's good stuff too it's just interesting uh, for the money, just how hard it is to find something that's as good as what you get for box speakers uh, without spending good, you know, big money. Different things to overcome, my friend. You know that. Yeah, I get it. I think there's more but, to it, but yeah. But but most people, like in your family room, you 
have been awkward or hard to do bookshelves. I know you wanted to, but yeah, um, no, we did involve on that. I, I think for what those costs, that's great. actually a pretty good system and it looks really good. Yeah. What'd you end up doing in there? Well, it's the deaf tech system and that was sponsored. So I didn't pay for that. Um, is that what and getting ripped out? I'm just kidding. Shame on you. It's I think for five ninety nine each. It's pretty decent. It's um. It, I was tech, yeah. they, had they, pretty they good stuff. Yeah, I was I was actually had very very low expectations going into it, and so we put it in, and I thought worst case scenario we'll rip it out and put something better in, but uh, it impressed me. It actually was was better than I expected. Again, we're talking about five ninety nine each. They're not crazy expensive. And uh, they, they play pretty loud. Uh, they've actually measured a little better than I expected. There's definitely some little issues, especially in the highest frequencies, but most of it not too noticeable. And then it's currently powered by a Pioneer receiver that's got Direct. Direct did a pretty good job getting everything, you know, in shape with those. So all in all, I think for what it costs, it's fine. You know, an impressive family people. room system. It's great. Yeah, and it's not it a serious great. system. It's You don't notice it really unless you look for it. His subs are architectural in the ceiling up high. Def tech subs as well. Biggest like, problem with those subs is they're rattling all the doors. Mm. There's it's a wall of doors and all the doors rattle from it. So um Michael Walker super chat. I'm more excited to upgrade my Nakamichi dr to the dragon when it comes out. Both the AWOL 3500 on 6200 120 inches. Is it time to buy? Anybody has anybody this this always comes up every day in my comment section. The Nakamichi soundbar. Has anybody ever heard this thing? I've never, I've never even seen it in person. Mm. I mean, the brand Goodbye. went out of business, so whatever has come back is somebody rebuying up the old name and producing yeah. new stuff. Is there anybody? I mean, Nero's gone, so is there anybody left from the original company that's a part of this, or is it just some sort of reimagining? Or I mean, I don't. Let me just say this: eight years ago, they were selling Nakamichi at Kmart because I bought a Nak Nakamichi set of headphones. This is the dumper. They seem really popular, but that last generation soundbar, like. Because it came out with like two dual 10 inch subwoofers, I think, and then two four pairs name. of rear speakers. I mean, at that point, it's like, is it really a soundbar? It's a home theater in a box. It's not a soundbar anymore. I, I mean, there's better soundbars out there. I mean, they're... a soundbar is like the yeah, Sennheiser, it's, it's a bar. A soundbar is one bar. Yeah. That's that's your only come in a box. One Deep bar. By not, not dual subwoofers, <laughs> not dual surround speakers. <laughs> We're now talking about home theater in a box. Yeah, that's it's a, a, that's a home theater in a box with sound a soundbar. Sound <laughs> yeah, home theater in a box with a soundbar. That's no longer a soundbar. Uh, but none of us have heard it, apparently. I haven't heard it. I tell you what, there's a little story. Nakamichi had reached out to me. They are going to pay me $400 to review the first generation one. Um, I think like a day later, I was like, hey, man, I didn't get any tracking number. So like, we decided to go with Techno Dad. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I was like, okay, but, well, and, and that's fitting. <laughs> Sorry, you'll do a great job of that. They were worried you'd be honest. That's the problem. <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, mm. where do you hear this Morant's review? What? Did, shot? what did you oh, yeah. How is? I, I hear oh, you review I'm not going to say nothing about the Morant's. You already know how I feel about the Morant's. I'm a vault dude. It's the opposite uh, of a little bright. <laughs> well, the second half of that question was the AWOL 3500 with the 120 inch screen the a wall for 6200 seems a bit steep honestly uh, what what's an a wall it's a ultra, a ultra short throw projector that's yeah. oh, okay. just another one of those companies that, but supposedly pretty good i mean they kind of came out of good. nowhere and i've yeah. been hearing good things about it for what it is yeah hisense makes it i just found that out like two days ago oh that's really I think, yeah oh, okay People keep telling me that the picture is a lot better than the Hisense. So if it's the same manufacturer, I'm surprised the picture's any different. Yeah, I don't know what software they're using. Oh, they made the same factory. Yeah. So yeah. somebody's asking me a question about the R versus S series per listen. Do you mind if I quickly take that? Yeah, yeah. So this comes up a lot, actually, about people wanting to know the difference between them in terms of sound quality. And I'll just say that the first time and every time since then that I've been able to... I mean, I don't have those like set up around. I have just the S series in walls, but... Um, when I have been able to do demos between the R and S series, to be honest, like 90% of the music we played, I couldn't tell the difference. Um, yeah, and it's not really... that like the S series is not good enough. It's that the S series is really, really good, but the R series is already really, really good as well. And that the difference between the two is relatively small and subtle. So there's certain music you can find that will pull up some of the differences. 
there are some technical advantages. The S series does have a little bit lower distortion, wider bandwidth. It does play louder. They do handle more power. They're a little bit more sensitive, things like that. And, and all of that has some value to it. But for the average person in a typical room, the R series is fine. The sound curve is the same. That's what Dan told me. It, it is. Really yeah, it's hard to try to get that signature per listen sound. I, I tell you, dude, of all the high end gear at that audio show, the R series was, I, I kept coming back. I was like, wow, I couldn't believe how good that system sounded. I mean, that, Kellen. Oh, was say, that was the only room really too, where me, you and Dan just kind of hung out about yeah. four or five minutes after the show was over and he was letting us throw on Crank it up, like turn it up. Yeah. Proper demo. <laughs> Yeah. Are the beryllium tweeters? Are, is that basically just for SPL? Does it just play louder than the R series? Like, what's uh? No, it's there's a little more to it than that. The beryllium tweeter has a higher breakup mode, and so that that does actually help to extend the highs a little bit. So it's not just about yeah. getting louder. I mean, the silk dome um, has a breakup mode to it that's actually better damped than in the beryllium, but it's much much lower. It's actually within the audible band bandwidth of the speaker, so it does there's more to it i mean like the the motor is less substantial on the tweeters and the r series as well it's a silk dome yeah um and uh and then tech stream on the two so the one with the brilliant the s series has tech stream for the two outer drivers and that gives it a little bit lower, lo better lower end performance but not quite as good in the upper end which it doesn't operate up there anyway just the brilliant one in the middle does um, I, you know, I can't give you a technical explanation for this, but every time I've heard a really good, not like any old, but a really good speaker that has brilliant tweeters in it, it seems to just sound a little bit more detailed, a little bit better than yeah. a lot of the others I've heard. And when I listened to the R series with the Silk Dome, I actually was surprised. Uh, they were, they weren't being totally clear with us when they were switching, when we first heard them. And, uh, I thought what I was listening to was the S series, which I had heard a couple times before. And uh, uh, was surprised, I guess, at how good the detail and high frequency sound was on that Silk Dome tweeter compared to the Beryllium. Like, it wasn't as different as I expected, even though, like, I've had really good experiences with these Beryllium tweeters in the past on other speakers. So, you know, I wouldn't say it's about just a little bit more SPL. I think there's a little more going on than that. But, I, you know, that I think the SPL actually is coming more from the beefier voice coil, bigger motor. Pretty damn close. Yeah. It is, is probably lighter. Is that true? Brilliant's got better off-axis response. I mean, in this particular case, they both have a good off-axis response. The off-axis response isn't really going to be based on the material. It's based on wave the guide. so the design of the dome itself yeah. is going to affect it, and then the waveguide. And on the case of the Perlison, the waveguide is going to dominate that off-axis response over the dome shape, and and so really, it's about the same between the two. Is the um... Is the like array or like the beam forming the same on both models as well? Or it is, it... yeah. I mean, it's different drivers. So the the R series is using all silk domes for all three of those drivers in the okay. tweeter array versus in the, like I said, in the S series, you've got text stream on the outer ones and brilliant in the middle, but it's the same concept. They operate in exactly the same way. And in the same sense that like, all right, so if you go with the R5M or R5T, you've got the two mid bass drivers, and then you've got those we'll call mid range tweeters. And then the center tweeter, those are all operating as part of the beam forming. And that mm -hmm. extends the beam formings bandwidth and the vertical out to the frequency range of those mid bass drivers to a point, but it, it's limited. The seven series adds the extra set of mid bass drivers. And those are shaded in the same way that the tweeters are. And so you actually get wider bandwidth in the beam forming. So the seven series actually has much broader bandwidth of that vertical directivity control than you get in the five series, which you can see if you look at their, their own charts that they show you actually make this pretty clear. So if you look at the vertical, those radar plots, basically little colorful, goofy looking things look like aliens. You'll see a much smoother, thin line in the middle of the vertical directivity plot of the seven series versus the five. Um, but otherwise, the concept's the same between the S and R series. There's no real difference. Yeah, I didn't. <clears throat> not that I compare them side by side, but I I listen to like the same five songs for every music review I do. I couldn't tell the difference between, or just remember the difference between the S and the R. That's why I bought the R's. I was like, this is good enough. Where I didn't have to spend the extra two or three grand, where I would just keep it as the reference speaker because those were just as good as what I think is the best speaker I've heard are the Soper speakers. Those are still my favorite, but I think for the price difference, R series 
just as good. Dude, those just Soper good. ones are dope. Yeah. yeah. Sopers yeah. in general are crazy cool. But they here's the deal. They just don't have the the SPL output and the per listens, even the lower series. You just can't get that kind of SPL output with a single dome tweeter. Yeah, but I think if I don't know, if you're just getting like a little bookshelf like that or in your living room, are you really cranking it down? I mean, for music. Probably, for probably music. not. I think for yeah. a lot of people, the average SPL capabilities of typical speakers is fine. Don yeah. and I have talked about this before. I mean, one of the reasons why I think people don't realize that a lot of speakers are not really adequate for like high end home theater where you're trying to hit yeah. reference levels is that most people don't listen anywhere near that when they're just casually listening to music or even watching TV or, or, or maybe movies in their family room. But when you move up to that situation where you're trying to actually achieve a, a like yeah. we'll call it a proper yeah, theater cool. experience. Yeah. Most typical speakers are actually not adequate for that just because they don't have the horsepower. They don't have the SPL for it in, you know, medium to large rooms. The whole point of the ProListen was to give you that kind of output capability and really what they yeah. constitutes from THX standards is large rooms. Because I'm designing with Anthony now, reality is like my sense of scale of what's a large room has shifted because <laughs> those rooms are like larger oh. at another level. It's like, like I, I oh, this Kellen is only 8,500 square feet or cubic feet. Sorry, not square feet. 8,500 cubic feet. Kellen's got a big room that would require a speaker that can carry that kind of SPL. Yeah. Kellen, what did, yeah. I don't know the size of your room. Actually, I know nothing about your theater. How, how big is uh, it? 18, 26 with 12 foot ceilings. Yeah. So that like the per listen would be kind of the minimum actually, and you may yeah. even in a room that large go larger yet to the next level. Well, he's up, got which... SoCal Utopia architectural in there now in the whole system. Yeah, I mean it's 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 like you said, like for as loud as I'm playing it, like it's plenty loud. But if you are wanting to go to the next level, I mean, yeah. I haven't really pushed it too hard because one, I really hardly ever have time to enjoy it in the first place, but two, it's just, um, yeah, I'd rather just enjoy yeah, it instead of there's, there's truth to that. Is this when you're trying to do a, a personal cinema for somebody like Matt and I are working on a room that's like what? 12, five cubic feet, 12,000. I Does think you know people keep giving lower numbers. I swear we calculated it out to like sixteen or seventeen thousand cubic feet. It might, it might have been. It's massive room, so we cool. had to really work with a manufacturer. And actually, Matt was instrumental in that and created a whole new LCR for that, and actually named it after Matt. Right? I named it after Matt. I don't know what they. Yeah, well, it. <laughs> whatever. But yeah, I mean, Matt really. Help me understand a lot of things on that because you know we'd always done like clips uh, or excuse me jbl synthesis or you know the big triad horn loaded and, and various different systems on that if you go behind a screen you have an acoustically treated room that's large it, it's nice to have that horsepower it really is yeah. but it's not necessary for normal people listening no and that know? speaker yeah. that i designed for that room is is ridiculously over the top it would be excessive <laughs> For any sort of normal sized room, even Kellen's room, which is actually a pretty big room, it would be an excessive speaker for. It was designed specifically six, to eight. give. Yeah, it's got six eight three eights, giant eight. ribbons. <laughs> in a waveguide, you know, and we're, yeah. we're getting some boost from the waveguide too. Um, I mean, the speaker will hit, but so I the we maxed out a version of this that didn't have all the tweeters working at like a hundred and twenty one decibels, I believe. Uh, using M noise, and I think we estimated that we should be at 129 then with the full system working. We weren't, we haven't tested that yet, but once we get the full version, we'll probably do that. And knowing Shane, we're probably going to blow it up in the process just to see. So I'll be like, well, it blew up at 131, but 129 decibels, you know, is a lot of output for a speaker that isn't using pro audio drivers. And that I think was you sort should of the do goal. A, I think you, sh you should do a video on like, um, regular home speakers, hi-fi speakers versus mm -hmm. speakers that are designed for like large yeah. spaces. That's actually a good I idea. That's a, that's a good you want to jump yeah. in on a live stream with us? We're, we're going to pick our, you know, weekly live stream back up. That'd be Matt and Don show or Don time. and Matt show. Sorry. Don, the Matt and Don show. Mm -hmm. We're going to, um, the Matt and we, well, we're going to, yeah. I mean, we're going to bring a bunch of guests, a lot of really cool people on, but that'd be a great subject. What is yeah. the difference between yeah. You know, a Meyer sound or a Sendo or one of the, you know, KRA or whatever or, higher output speakers. Yeah. Or just like a well, Meyer or, or a Sendo. 
mm-hmm. versus like those brands versus like why you wouldn't use like a Kef Q series for a space like that. I, I actually, so people kind of ask me about that. I've even had people to go to Shane's point earlier. People sometimes challenge me on that. They're like, why can't you use a, like I've used clips or I've used Kef or whatever in pretty yeah. large rooms. They sound fine. It's like, you know, when I'm designing a room for a client that's that big, I can't rely on it's fine. Like it's, I actually have to have hard numbers that tell me it's going to be able to hit. It's got to be 105 decibels at the listening position for each one of those LCRs. Reality is none of those speakers can come close to it. So you have to get up to yeah. something like a Meyer sound or a Pro Audio Tech or Corke Array or any of those. And then for us as designers, it's about picking what a brand that has at that output level a sound quality that's good enough because it can be really hard to get speakers that rely on those pro audio drivers that also sounds really good. There's a lot of companies that have been on the market a while that are really balance, offering. Man. Yeah. The, I, the I think kind of mediocre products. And I think it's hard for normal folks to <clears throat> in like envision uh, being in a big space with kind of a normal Best Buy type of speaker to know how that kind of speaker would fill such a large, like large space. Cause when I went to the Sendo theater, um, he was cranking the 80 inch. I was like, oh, I was like, yo, that 50 inch probably is not going to be big enough for this room. He goes, no, absolutely not. Maybe two fifties and the fifties are big subwoofers, but to be in a space like that, to all of know those are that, big subwoofers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but you could tell standing there, I was like, oh, 50 is not, it's not big enough for this. He goes, no, it's not. So for folks to, I think to, to get a grasp in their head, like, yes, this can hit an SPL in this size room but not in this size room, I think is a topic that you should guys, you should talk about. Yeah. And somebody's asking if JTR counts as good sound for large rooms. Yeah. JTRs are pretty decent speakers. I think they sound decent and they definitely play loud. Uh, M and K is not pro audio. No. And they don't play loud enough. Not anymore. I mean, there were near, near field monitors near field, we used yeah. for theaters before and they played pretty loud, but I mean, they just, they're not, they were good for what was called a THX large room, which is still something sure. that's going to be under five or 6,000 cubic feet. And that's still, the reality is, as apparently Kellen can uh, attest to in Texas, homes have gotten bigger in the U.S. And as a result of homes getting bigger, theaters are getting bigger. So the average theater is now really more in that three to 5,000 cubic foot room. Slightly above average theaters are five to 7,000 cubic foot. Like Those are much more common than they used to be, whereas that used to be pretty unusual. And getting a 8,000, 10,000, 12,000, 17,000 cubic foot room is actually not unheard of. And because of that, we need speakers that have the output, the horsepower to really deal with that. Yeah, just because a tower is a big tower, yeah. I repeat, does not mean it's going to play at sustained volume the, level. The size of the speaker actually doesn't matter theater. at all. Right. Yeah, it's it's the individual drivers end up becoming the limiting factor in many cases. The tweeter is the most common one. So I, you know, Aaron and I actually got into a, I won't call it like an argument, but a little bit of a disagreement about this. But what you'll find is that, yes, the mid bass drivers tend to give out pretty early, but you, you know, you can add more of them in a speaker. You can high pass them. You can do things like this is actually part of how both Focal and Kef work with their in wall stuff. You can take their top of line in wall speaker and then you can do an array with an additional it's like a sub module one of the reasons to do that is not to use it as a subwoofer but actually just to give you more output in that 80 to let's say 200 hertz range where the driver starts to become a limiting factor but at some point you're going to hit the limit of the tweeter and that's actually the thing that you can't overcome so whatever the tweeter can do that's all it can do you can't add another tweeter to get more output out of it it's just part of the design of the speaker so in these larger rooms typical dome tweeters just don't have the output to handle really, really large rooms. And it doesn't matter how many mid base modules or whatever you add onto it, you're never going to overcome that limitation. Well, I think you should guys should talk about active speakers as well. Cause I think mm. that is an important topic. That's not really covered a whole lot. And it kind of segues into, I wouldn't say really the pro audio world, but mainly um, that's where you kind of see it um for right now anyways it, there are some yeah that I mean, i've been in the theaters that have been built from various different people over the years where you'll go in they'll have a set of towers and they'll have a bunch of subs and they'll crank it up to ludicrous level and it you know the guy's like it's that rocks don't it and i'm like it's kind of compressed I mean, you know you, mm. this doesn't sound right i mean it'll play louder it's just not 
clear and clean and articulate like you want it to be. You talking about pirate speakers? No, I'm just talking about mm-hmm. conventional speakers like a BMW, Kef, what, whatever brand. Oh, it turned up have. really loud. Yeah. Turned up really, really loud. Cranked underpowered usually with just a big receiver running it with several subwoofers in it. It'll play very, very loud. Yeah. Yeah. And shake the, you know, the, the platform and, you know, people think it's great, but it's not. It's, it, it tonally changes as you crank that volume and it almost gets to the point where it's harsh. It hurts. That, that like, actually is a common thing that you'll get people talking about. I don't like to listen loud. And in many cases, what they really aren't realizing is that they're reacting to the distortion, which creates a harshness. Bingo. And the first time you hear a speaker that's capable of like a lot more output, um, often it's it's sort of a an epiphany that it's not about you don't like listening loud. It's you don't like listening to computers or computers, uh, speakers that are, are compressing and, and, you know, essentially are, are being overwhelmed by what's being sent to them. Uh, the other one is clipping amplifiers. I mean, it's not uncommon for a speaker to have a bit more output than you're actually getting out of it, but the amp is just clipping, you know, near constantly because you're pushing it to its limits. And that's another thing that I think people sometimes react to and just say, I don't like to turn it up that loud. It hurts. It's like, yeah, mm-hmm. listening to a clipping amplifier hurts. Mm-hmm. It's like those per listens we listened to this weekend. Literally, we played it pretty loud for a short amount of time, obviously. But as that volume rose and rose and rose and rose, and it, it tonality didn't change, it didn't hurt, it just was just bigger, it just yep. louder. I mean, yep. it, it wasn't painful at all. It's, in my opinion, that's what any good speaker should be capable of doing. Um, yeah. And it's it's not universally true. Yeah, obviously I like Perlison, so I talk a lot about that. There are other brands that are capable of doing the same thing. Um, even the really high-end cat stuff actually can play pretty darn loud. Um, it's just a little below really the Perlison, and it's impressive, especially the reference metal line, how loud that stuff can play. Um, and then you get into stuff like Meyer Sound. I mean, that's the next level. You're talking about another 10 plus decibels of additional output you're going to get out of those types of brands, or Pro Audio Tech is another one like that. Or would JTR, you, for that matter. Would you say or, that having powered speakers are better than using external amps? Well, external amps can still, I mean, I think when you say powered speakers, what you mean is like an active design, right, mm-hmm. Kellen? Yeah. 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 So that still may use, because I'll just say, like, personally, I when I'm designing theaters, I don't like speakers that have the amps built into the speaker. I prefer when they're rack mount. And it's just a service thing. It's just a little bit trickier to have to put yourself in a situation yeah. where the speaker potentially you has run to be power removed. to every location. Yeah. I mean, there, there's, so yeah, I mean, you, you, same thing with, with it's not, with that's not my band. favorite, but it's not that in and of itself is it, but that's not the point. So in terms of active versus passive systems, which is really more about the crossover and how that's handled, you know, active just gives you a lot more control. So you can design really, really good speakers that are passive, but there's going to be losses in the crossover. And there's a limit. I mean, there's just it costs a lot of money to keep putting in all those elements, those parts that give you that that extra degree of control. And you're never really going to equal what you can do with DSP. I mean, with passive, maybe three or four bands of EQ, so to speak, could be done with trap filters and then, you know, per driver. And then you're going to have, you know, maybe up to fourth order without having to get into some tricky kind of designs with active designs you can get away from, you can use FIR filters, for instance, to do much more sophisticated crossovers that are phase perfect. And you can create a transient perfect speaker. You can have a hundred bands of EQ, you know, per driver. I mean, it's just a lot, lot more flexible. And so you can make a a more perfect speaker that way. The disadvantage is that it needs to have really good ADDA conversion and you're kind of stuck with their amp too. Like if you don't like their amp, if it's not a great amp, that, that can be an issue. There's not many speaker companies doing that yet, having you know fully active capability like that. It in the really high end stuff, it's pretty common. So in those really big speakers we were talking about, like the Pro mm-hmm. Audio Tech, the Meyer Sound, those are all yeah, active, yeah. and and that's yeah. just how that is. Um, it, you know, even um, Anthony the Gramani system speakers are fully active too. Mm-hmm. So at that kind of level, everything is for the most part active, but at the more mid kind of mid not mid yeah, kind of residential. Like mid, Speakers. residential stuff yeah that yeah, typically is passive do doesn't it take the guesswork out of having to choose amplifiers for your speaker because it's it's already pre-planned for you it's already done for you yeah but i would also say people who are buying those kinds of systems probably aren't picking their own amps either they're, they're letting the designer handle that but i suppose from a designer standpoint it means you don't have to sit there and like learn 10 different amp lines you just 
you know, if you're, if you're doing Meyer sound, it's the amps are part of the package. In fact, they are built into the speakers typically and you have to run power to them. And, uh, so you just go with it, you learn it, they've got software. I and mean, one of the nice things when you're an integrator is you want to be able to monitor the, the system, every aspect of it, you know, something's going to go down. You want to be able to log in and figure out what went down and remotely, you know, reset it, something like that. So with most of those brands, you've got QSYS and I forget, what is Meyer sound? What do they call their control software? Um, gosh, you had to put me on the spot like that. Um, it's uh, not that important. Bro. But, yeah. but anyway, the point is they've got, you know, something like that, you know, Don knows that for a lot of the other equipment that, that, you know, we all like to use oversee is a pretty common monitoring software option that we use to look at that. Like, you know, having, let's say oversee plus one other, other system, not a big deal, but like if it's oversee plus the Meyer sound system, plus QSYS plus, you know, I don't know, whatever. <clears throat> has. Overseas in the new Sony receivers, by the way. That's true. So, um, Matt, they're using the Galileo Galaxy for their outboard, like DSP and everything like that. That's rack mounted, and then the software that controls everything is called Compass. Compass, it's that's the, right. Yeah. The in-house deal uh, that they created. Does um, all right. Let's say you're putting together a really big theater. Or you got like thirty speakers or whatever. <clears throat> Doesn't matter if you're going with something like an Anthem or a Trinovamp or more pro gear like a Crown or something like that. Because everybody always talks about Crown amps. Um, whereas, like, you get something like a Trinov, obviously, it's more. Which one? Crown makes cheap ones and they make badass ones. So. Well, I would, I would assume the badass ones. Badass ones, yeah. I mean, the performance of even the best Crown amps is still not going to equal like what you're getting out of those Trinov amps in terms of distortion and noise. Right. Um, they're they're actually kind of mediocre in that regard, the the distortion and noise performance. But for a lot of people, I mean, they put out a ton of power, mm -hmm. which is really what they're designed for, is putting out a lot of power in a reliable way in you know a two U unit. Um, if you want the lowest possible noise and distortion, you've got a dedicated theater where it's, we've made it soundproof and we've made the room have like you know a zero dB noise floor or even less. Personally, I wouldn't put crowns in there. I wouldn't put anything like that in there. I probably would stick with the quietest amps I could find because you're going to hear the hiss from the amp otherwise. Right, right, right. It's always been a problem. With, I've done a bunch of crowns and from churches to multi, you know, crowns around subwoofers and all that, and they are noisy. I mean, um, you know, you've got the crowd that says they're just as good, and yeah. I'm not going to get in that argument because that's a very heated debate. But they're just they're commercial amps designed for PAs and churches and loud commercial systems. Yeah. They're yeah. robust and reliable and they make some really good ones, but they're just not as good as a really well engineered and usually pricier amp. <laughs> okay. Um, how important would you say it is to match your amps with your speakers? Like if you have a really high sensitivity speaker, how important is it to match it with an amplifier so you don't hear the hiss? I mean, that. I think that actually is pretty important. So yeah. one of the common complaints you get from people that have really high sensitivity speakers is that otherwise quiet amps are suddenly noisy, hissy, yeah. you know, machines. It's actually Anthony, I got into discussion about this because his speakers use really efficient drivers. In, in particular, the compression driver on his top speakers is a uh, 120 plus dB at one watt. So what happens is that you're running at the noisiest part of the amp at really high levels. And so... In, from a design standpoint, you typically would want to try to address that with something like an L pad that helps to bring down essentially the sensitivity of that tweeter so that you're running more power out of the amp and it's and you're getting into the range where the noise has gone down quite a bit. But I mean, a, another maybe better solution is use something like a Purify amp, for instance, which is about as quiet as it, as it gets. You're just not going to have yeah. any noise issues anymore with something like that. So what's up with this Galvatron, dude? Like, why are you even here, dude? <laughs> No, you're not you're not supposed to address the trolls. You're supposed to skip past it. <laughs> read just read it, ignore skip it. past it, and just ignore it. <clears throat> I know. Fucking we're all having a cool audio conversation. This is this these are the people these this. are the people that are like there's diminishing returns after you get yeah, a certain point. Like, this is, that's, these, these, these kind of people would say these hot like pockets that. and like <laughs> what the fuck? This is like these guys are like clips are just as good as uh focals. As uh, folks that say this stuff. Sure. Shane, you have interesting right. viewers. That's all I can say. <laughs> I don't understand where they come from. Like, why would you even take the time to do that? 
like, oh, I'm going to show them. You know what I mean? Like, nobody gives a fuck, dude. Really? <laughs> like, seriously? I, I just, it still kills me how people are. You know what I mean? So, um, can you mount an ultra short throw projector in the ceiling still in front of the screen as a you can to want to stand? they say you can but you can I've seen well you you can't though with those like samsung or high sensor a walls because they won't work upside down so well, they're designed you only for you. you can with the epson yeah with it but not with those other ones so any of these like all-in-one deals they've been selling that that you know like oh no. like the little like soda can ones no 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 i'm talking about like the samsung's or the, the other brands yeah, or, yeah the, the, those have gotten really popular is or the high sense which apparently is the same as they the you can. um those the are not because i actually wanted to do that in the i wanted to do that outside in a protect, protected box and i was going to use one of those and i contacted the companies for each of those and every one of them said no it has to be used at a fixed distance from the screen and it has to be sitting on, you know, like upright, basically. It can't be upside down because they don't have an ability to flip the image. They, they don't, don't have, have any sort of zoom. They don't have an inversion. They don't have an inversion yeah. and they don't have any Samsung, zoom. Samsung does, though. So whoever you talk to at Samsung. Oh, that's what they told me. I was like, wow, that one's out. Cut him out. All yeah, because right. um, we, we installed. So here's the thing. I get asked this oh, quite often, actually. You, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on short throws a lot because I feel like there's a lot of stuff out there on them but there's misconceptions still um a lot of people that are still trying to find the solution but the samsung if you flip it upside down you can no longer really use the screen that's used for alr because now the whole point of if you have a traditional ultra short throw and the screen material is jagged uh, like the sawtooth design that helps catch the light shining up, but help reject the light shining down. Well, if you flip the ultra short throw upside down, well, now it's going to try to block that light. Well, then everybody's just saying, hey, flip the screen upside down. Well, now you're catching all the sunlight and all the ambient light too. So you have to, if you're going to ceiling mount an ultra short throw, you would like to, I don't ever like to say use the word need to, but you would like to use it in a dedicated room as much as possible because you're going to need, going to want to use a non-ALR ultra short throw screen. Um, you it also, probably would just be a standard white screen though, right? At that point, so you got to be careful with white because if the ultra short throw is a decent short throw and has a you know a, a higher output, you can get some hot spotting with a white screen. Um, so I always just like to do a negative gain screen like a pure gray from si or pure gray from stewart um i think epv has one as well dragonfly high contrast gray if you're a snap guy um a lot of a lot of people say that you can do an acoustically transparent screen with short throw you cannot do a woven screen uh, i actually consulted with a guy that was um, being told that that was the route that he needed to go from a very respectable company. <laughs> really? Uh, away. Yeah, I'm not <clears throat> part of the bus. But I was like, man, here's your, here's the best thing to do is just ride it out with them because after you have a bad experience, like they're going to be the only ones that can help you because they recommended that route to go with. It's as hard to place a center channel if you're using a horizontal center channel with a throat, short throw projector. Yeah. And so um, if you can do an acoustically transparent screen, but then it goes back to you can't use an ALR. So like even if you're using slate, uh, for an example, uh, yes, it's an ALR screen, but the trajectory of the short throw is not the traditional sense. It'll of reflect it. <laughs> exactly. It'll be trying to block it out. So, a slate or a black diamond. They, they just don't work. I think you have to buy a proprietary screen with with those or one built for that right so it, yeah. there's there's a little, there's some shortcomings to them and if you're using acoustically transparent screen you do need to use micro perped and then that goes into another segue of how far away are you setting from it well then that becomes a conversation mm -hmm. of most of the time it's a retrofit for a living room so you're not setting 14 15 foot away to not be able to see the micro perf have you done that a, a micro perf screen with a short throw i didn't know you could do that that's the only one that I have not done it. And I try to stay away from it. 
and I always say too, is like, you're already going down the untraditional sense of, you know, doing a home theater. Let's do a traditional projector, rear throw, acoustic transparent screen. You're already compromising you in a short throw. So yeah. what's it really matter to you if the center channel's below the projector or, you know, if you can find a slim enough speaker to fit below the screen or an in wall below the screen. Compromise though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're already compromising. So what? Because I would use one if other, for other than that, but I have no place to put a short throw projector. Yeah. So that that's my take on short throws. Have you have you guys installed any ultra short throws in like a high end dedicated theater? Um, I wouldn't <laughs> go as far as to say it's high end dedicated theaters yes because there's still the customer out there that wants the simplicity of hey i really ha- like samsung tvs throughout my house i really like the ties and software that's built into the short throw it's familiar it's i just want to arc it back to a receiver and it's just like okay um but a lot of times what you know if we're really we'll have the customer that kind of already has a plan in their head and we kind of just like you know, make sure it'll work and bounce our ideas off of it. But most of the time we're helping that customer from the very beginning to finish. So it's not so much of that, but. So someone here is asking about rear projection. I'm just Kellen. I'm curious. Um, So I have my opinions on this, but I haven't had, I mean, to me, rear projection nowadays is more of a problem solver than like a go-to solution. Yeah, it would do never you, be a do you spec them in much? I don't spec them in at all. No. Yeah. How, you, how I, does that even work? I see it always in the menu. Like you're shining it so from a well, separate you're reversing behind the image. Yeah, you're, you're mirroring the image basically. And, and it you, comes through the front and it looks just as good? Yes. So the material is different. It's a semi-translucent material. And when the image hits it, you'll see it projected on there. And, and of course, mm. there were you know big screen TVs back when like I was a kid. Um, yeah, Don, you were an adult, like Mitsubishi's then. and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, those use rear projection. <laughs> but um, oh, true, yeah. I mean, okay. front project or rear projection? Rear projection, yeah. I mean, that's the way big yeah. screen TVs used to work, is they basically yeah. were rear projection systems built yeah. into a box, a bunch of mirrors to kind of so nick the we've, image. Up. We've done a few rear projection systems for a couple of reasons, you know, and whatnot. I've had a theater room where we cut a hole out in the wall and did a, a 156 inch 235 to one screen we did a runco projector in the other room there was a big room behind it but most of them we you were able to purchase like a housing like a frame and that frame would set the projector in and it would bounce off a mirror and, and project right onto the screen is that- it was a little little challenging to get positioned but and yeah. you know you just don't have much effect from ambient light you would if yeah. on the screen, but we did one because the guy liked to do karaoke with the lights up and his theater room was huge. It was like a theater, but had a big dance floor kind of thing on it. And we well, actually won a, a bunch of wars with that one. So. Is that I guess he's doing that for like screen? outdoor systems and stuff too. It's a very specific screen. Yeah, you have to yeah, have it, a it, projection it, material. Like, uh, if you look at SI, they call it the 365. We do it on oh, our I outdoor gotcha. screens. I've shown you that, Shane, where we do it in the mosquito net. Yeah, okay. Shoot up. Right, they right, make... Right. Some of them look like a lens even, like they have some hard materials that actually have like a lens look to it that, that are used for that. I mean, it's kind of an old school approach. It's not used mm-hmm. as much anymore. I, I could see specking it in for problem solving where you like you can't put the projector in front. But just really quick, the reason why I wouldn't spec it in a high-end home theater anymore is that in if this is like a dedicated high-end home theater, really ideally the speaker should be behind the screen and you can't project an image through speakers. So you've created a sound compromise for picture I don't know that the picture is any better. Um, you know, really personally, I would rather Wouldn't it do be worse. A, I would think it would be worse. No. I mean, it's it's such an old technique that I haven't seen yeah. what it looks like with today's best projectors, so I can't really answer that. Looks good. Yeah. Stuart Stewart had well, actually, it was Barco and Mad VR had a setup at the Tola Expo um, for Cedia. It's like the smaller Cedia for Texas and Oklahoma area. Mm-hmm. But uh, they had a rear projector, and I was like, "This looks awful." Like, it, <laughs> there you it, go. Yeah, it was like just super, just fuzzy. I mean, it just looked awful. And I was like, "Man, 
I would uh, not be displaying this. If, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this I, is our $80,000 Barco, and it's like, oh, geez. Listen, Terrible. in the high-end space, you're going to see micro LEDs eventually surpass yeah. projection systems. They're just hands down superior. Yeah, they're awesome, dude. You know, they're I mean, Matt's sick. seen them. Yeah. yeah. I've seen them. I mean. I do think that they are going to re probably replace projection eventually and that we're going to see more of a split. Like right now, it's still pretty rare. They're, they're still pretty sure. pricey. But as they come down in price, and I think actually for people like Don, Kellen, and I, like we have to evolve with that because our design approach is built around projection systems and TVs. And now it's going to have to be built around basically giant direct view TV, boxes. TV, yeah. Everything's going to be different. But then the center channel thing is going to be, uh, you know, yeah, it creates a new challenge. Seen, yeah, if you've never seen a really good 4K micro LED installed properly, you just you can't have an opinion yet because it's it, it's it's like a giant TV. It literally yeah. is, you know, full HDR, Dolby Vision. I mean, it's just... yeah. Well, and like HDR really was built around what is it? Ten thousand nits was the standard. I, I think a thousand or eleven hundred is the minimum that you have to have. Something but like that. This, I thought there was like a brightness that was like, yeah, it might have been there. higher, but I'm just saying that as a reference point. Yeah, but, but no projector. The point is, projectors aren't even yeah. close to that. They're like, yeah, can't 200. Even get close. no projector. Yeah. So, I mean, I saw the um, I saw the uh, the LED at the the OLED in Germany that's rated at a thousand nits at 260 inches, which was blinding. I can only was imagine cool? what. 10,000 this will look like. Yeah. Do it yeah. Look cool. yeah. I mean, it's supposed to be mostly just for like really bright specular highlights. Like I think the concept yeah. would be if you walk outside and it's really sunny and you're getting a reflection off of a car that's yeah. really shiny, that that really shiny part would be blindingly bright in real yeah, life. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. on a movie, typically it's not even close. So to yeah. give you that more realistic view. Plus, you know, I think we already have been driving people deaf with home theaters. Now we need to start blinding them too. <laughs> well, yeah. if you stand up and look it, back on one of those Christie's or, the you know hundred thousand dollar Sony those will burn it, your eyes yeah it was 000, crazy because twenty thousand Anzi lumens they had the uh the Barco Freya Plus there which was a I thought it was That's amazing great, I was like holy shit I was like yo this is the by the way yeah I was like this is the great sharpest projector. projector I've ever seen but then he was like well I'm gonna raise the screen we'll look at the micro LED I was just like <laughs> it was like the heavens opened up it. man I was like Throw oh my rocks god at it. no it if you've seen a micro a really good yeah. and I'm not talking about one at a stadium I'm talking about uh, you know <laughs> really good yeah like a good one micro yeah. led yeah. it'll change you man I'm, i i i anyways i can't talk about it, but i i've been around and seen them and and yeah. spent some time with them and it, it's enjoyable you know what's cool on them is video games <laughs> playstation mario, man, mario kart. what's that is that mario kart i don't know yeah mario kart at 260 inches is awesome come I'm on <laughs> Kelly, regarding home theater automation, do you prefer Control 4 or URC? Ask Don. <laughs> <laughs> I know the answer for Don. I know the answer, too. I mean, I listen, to... URC makes a good product. It's yeah. reliable. But URC makes, like, cheap remotes, and then they make a, a control system. Mm -hmm. However, it's not as capable as Control 4. Control 4 is really, it streams audio and does a lot of things. I'm intimate with both systems, and I'm telling you Control 4. But... You know, URC. Uh, I, don't know. I mean, Control for you, you have to have an authorized dealer to control it. I think URC wants mm -hmm. you to, but I mean, they're both good. Depends on your budget. What do you want to do? If you want to really expand that that automation control from one room to a whole house, Control for makes more sense. I think in a single room application that they're both comparable. Where does uh, Christian fall into that? Um. Well, they're not really shipping too much stuff, right? <laughs> Now, Crestron is a higher end system, requires a, um, definitely a much more expensive system. It requires um, a lot more programming. It's all custom programmed. Not really a, a Control 4 is a much easier system to program. That's why Control 4 has exploded to be the biggest home automation company in, in the world. Crestron is very reliable. It's used in large applications and deployments like, you know, nasa military installations fortune 500 company boardrooms it's a great product so but it's a lot more expensive a lot are any of those well is control for end user uh, adjustable no, none of no? these are, end none user of these are adjustable, no you got to go to google home kit or 
some you know i wish harmony went the one way but yeah it's it's yeah you know, listen a lot of people are like i don't need that shit i will program myself to get on there i mean they're infinitely more capable than a google home kit or any of these systems out there yeah. and they can be a true home automation system and they're very reliable if the network is properly built for them um depends on you know to, on each person my clientele and in, in a lot of ways matt's clientele they just want to write a check they don't give a shit. They don't mm -hmm. want to program. They don't want to adjust. They don't want to calibrate. They want to come home, put on a t-shirt, open a bottle of wine and play music and adjust their lights and watch TV or go in their theater and get blown away. That's the deal. We're not here to go. Uh, everybody's wrong on the do it yourself market. That's not because shit, I'm do it yourself money myself <laughs> personally, but our clients, that's what they want to do. Right, Matt? They just want to write a check. <laughs> No, it's absolutely true. Most of the people we deal with don't want to touch this. They don't even really want to talk to us. <laughs> you know, they've got somebody else talking to us. Yeah. Um, I mean, I suppose that depends on the market level, but there's at the highest right. end of the market, you're dealing with people who just want it to work. And and in fact, one of the reasons why, I mean, Don, you taught me this. One of the reasons why you spec in systems like this is because we have to be confident that what we're specking in actually is going to be reliable for the client. Correct. And so like you've right. said to me before things like, well, Matt, like it's good, but are you confident that thing isn't going to go down, you know, once a week or once a month? And then yeah. it makes me think, well, gosh, I don't know. Well, that's what that they pay us for. I mean, they pay us because they, they're trying to pick out kitchens. They're trying to figure out, work with their interior designer, work with their builder. I mean, we do high, high level stuff. I'm not, I mean, it's cool. You know what I mean? But I'm a blue collar work, you know, working in the trenches guy too. So I, I understand the whole kind of shunning that, you know, but you have to understand people of means are busy running fortune 500 companies. They're doctors, they're high end attorneys, they're financial advisors. Their lives are consumed with what they want to do. The last thing they want to do, they might look at an article to here and there. They don't give a shit about clips versus, you know, Focal versus whatever brand they just want it to sound good. Yeah. Some people are a little different, but uh, from the most part, they just want to write a check. And then that's where we have to deliver what we promise to them. And so we do all the research and we do literally my company. We do hundreds of jobs of all kinds of scale from $10,000, $15,000, $20,000 jobs up to over a million dollar projects. I mean, in the biggest, What's literally the biggest homes in America. I well, mean, for, for like you and Kellen, what is like the... Um the average price point of a home theater setup. Let's just say home theater setup. Nothing, no, no multi-room stuff, but like home theater. What do you think the most, <clears throat> the average amount of money? That now, 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 what does that mean? Does that mean acoustic treatments, seats, platform, no, lighting? Like, like, do control? most people, no, do most people not spend? Just, not just a, a projector and speakers and a receiver. Like, does somebody come to your house? Most people spend, hey, I got 10 grand I want to spend on this. Or do the average folks say, most That's people say, I, want to, I got 50 grand to spend on this? Yeah, I would say, you know, what, what keeps the lights on here is uh, the customers that are doing full systems in that, I would say, 10 to 18 range. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I'll have. You know, not not the scale of Don's company at Haven Smart and things, but, but you do big theaters, yeah. though. I mean, you do. Yeah, we 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 have a couple of great projects that we did last year um, that I were a, that I was a part of, and we haven't really been able to showcase those yet, just because it's it's one thing that we are learning too is some of these larger projects take forever. Yep. Um. So you know, I had a several hundred thousand dollar theater in los angeles that'll be wicked um a couple of really good ones in in dallas and things like that so yeah we'll have the occasional you know i would say really good theater but for the most part you know we're doing twelve fifteen thousand uh, dollars we're probably doing three or four of those a week so. <clears throat> i've got projects that i had done all the design work on back in like 2020 that aren't done yet yeah it's, it's crazy i can only imagine i'm trying to like get my portfolio together put it on my website to show people what i've done and like the coolest biggest projects that i'm either actively working on or my work is done but like i don't build the theaters i just do the design yeah, work i haven't even 
drove yeah. the first nail or anything yet. Yeah. There's I'm a like, select few groups of people in this country, very select, that do the big Keystone theaters. I'd love to tell you that I'm you know, every week I'm doing, you know, a million dollar theater. <laughs> I wouldn't be driving a forerunner. I'm just saying, you know, you have the Anthony Gramanis, the Keith Yates, a couple of the design groups. Then you have some high end integrators, um, California, Chicago, New York, Miami, sometimes in Colorado. And, and that varies obviously because clients have multiple homes, but, and you have these high end integrators like we are who, we're so busy. We do motorized shades. We do um, circadian rhythm driven low voltage lighting. That's RGBW. We do we do a whole whole home. Although I know a ton about acoustics, I'm not an acoustician. Um, I know tons about this. I know tons about that. But I bring in Matt Pose now does all of my high end theater design because he's a badass and he's he's at that maximum level with the Grimani and the Keith Yates. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff goes around there. There's not tons and tons of these things being cranked all the time. And of course, there's also a bunch of um, what's the fish that swims on the shark that sucks on the back? What's that called? Anybody know? Leech. More, no, I'm worried, huh? Whatever. There's a lot of dudes out there claiming to be, you know, they wear bright colored shirts and this and that. And they're they've got a great marketing campaign and they're basically fucking snake oil con men and they're putting in theaters. That's just, my, you know, my hurt way. your fucking ears, man. I mean, Matt and I have experienced that. <clears throat> I'm just yeah. saying there's a bunch of them out there that claim to be experts. And when you actually get, you know, and the client, client doesn't know, people associate loud with good. What is what is yours done? Where do your clientele come from? Like, I, I understand where Kellen's would come from because he's got, he's on YouTube and shit like that. But, like, where do you get your clients from? Like, how does this um, even work for, like, the people that aren't on YouTube or whatever? Get their clients from... Well, it really varies, but home builders, high-end home builders. I mean, ultra chic high-end home builders. Um, we get clients from on social media, people seeing our work, yeah. awards that we've won. Um, interior designers. Of, uh, referrals, uh, interior designers, architects that, that consult with us. So when, when a client brings me into a project, 90% um, of the time, it's just not for a theater room. 95% of the time it's not it's it's for a complete comprehensive system from wiring to power management to lighting to shades to security to surveillance cameras to um, enterprise grade ruckus driven high Wi-Fi networks that rival any Wi-Fi you're ever going to find any place um, landscape audio outdoor systems I mean I put beam sensors on docks and surveillance cameras that monitor landscape audio so it's a really comprehensive thing and a lot of times we get a client not a lot but more sometimes we get a client that's building a media room or a high-end theater room and they want to do something on scale with the with the house that they do however somebody like anthony Gramani or keith yates and i include matt pose in that people are specifically seeking them out because through social media word of mouth whatever to specifically do a theater Matt, nobody's coming to you right now and saying, I want to do a whole home system, right? No. I, and I would I would have to defer to somebody else because I don't know how to do that. It, it, like that's not my specialty. Yeah. So and literally each each individual segment of what we do is its own discipline, like motorized shades. That sounds easy enough, but what kind of shades do you want? You want dark and you want double, dual roll? How do you want them to sit? <clears throat> I mean, it's maddening. There's a ton of work that goes in that lighting control. Right now, we're starting to do, instead of um, from an electrical panel to a switch to a bank of lights, now we're doing these panels that go with a category cable, like a category six, that go to low voltage lighting. That's that's controlled by a what's called a DMX processor. And these lights are are tunable. So they, they cover a full spectrum of light from, a, you know, 20, uh, 2,000 Kelvin to 4,000 Kelvin or whatever that ends up being. So we're able to actually do, if you guys don't know what circadian rhythm is, you should look it up. It's basically how the, the phases of the sun and the rotation of the sun around the earth affects all living creatures from plants to animals. So in the morning, we have systems that will actually go to a certain brightness that mimics the outdoor light brightness in the morning. And as the day progresses, that light slowly increments up. Then as you reach a certain point, comes down. 
I mean, that's cool. So we're doing a lot of state of the art stuff. We're doing um, this thing called Josh AI, which is basically an Alexa on steroids. It's an artificial learning system. So it's, if you go into a, a room with Alexa, you go, hey, Alexa, play Stevie Nicks, right? And or if it's if it's another area, you have to name that out. It's kind of limited on what you can do Where this. You can just go in a room and go, hey, you know, Josh, turn on the lights, adjust the lights to 40 percent, turn on the TV. I want to watch, the, you know, the Avengers on Disney, blah, blah, blah. You just speak to it and it knows where you're at and what you want to do. And it actually learns your voice patterns and, and your habits and what you do. So a lot of what we do is complete package in a house. We're focused in our little group here, which is my favorite on the audio side and, and, and focused on the, um, um, you know, the theater. We also do a lot of landscape audio um, or, or high output audio where we, we have brands of speaker companies that you may have never heard of, like James. James is an icon in our industry. Most people have never heard of it. They make speakers like they'll make a, a all aluminum housing a little bit bigger than a lunchbox. They'll have an eight inch sub, um, a five and a quarter inch driver and a four tweeter away, right? A pair of those cost nine grand. It'll play 116 decibels out of a, of a literally an opening in the ceiling that big. So, but people don't want to see speakers. I don't know why, but they just don't. So a lot of what we do is architectural. We do invisible speakers. Sorry to rant, but I just want people to know what we do. So in, in, in the scheme of things, we're not knocking anybody that's, poor because i'm poor you know poor ish um but you know we have to look at so a lot of these big houses have five six seven hundred thousand dollar budgets but that's not in the theater i would say our average theater is between 50 and a hundred thousand and this is coastal coastal is another one of the higher end outdoor lines they actually have a whole coastal liner store? right oh yeah, they were coastal, dude, coastal source rocks we we got to check them out and listen to them a bunch <clears> of <throat> the show they're 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 pretty badass man I was gonna uh, say that's so that James room on its own was pretty impressive. What's that? <clears throat> Just knowing what they were, I said that demo room was pretty Oh cool. yeah. Yeah, they had their outdoor speakers set up like a high end two channel system. I mean, it basically oh, that, is. They've got a full line array that's like is I actually haven't seen the line array in person, but it looks like it's I have the person. Told us all about it. They custom make their drivers. Each section of the line array focuses on a different area and dispersion. Um it's called Coastal Source is the name of the company and they so powersoft makes all their amps they make their own proprietary wires so you can run a this thick bury bury um you can bury it super durable cable and you can run it to one speaker then run it to another and run it to a sub and run it to another yeah, everything was they yeah. that's what i thought was really cool and then they do their own design services as well to make sure <clears throat> and everything so that was powersoft makes their amps matt and they're, they make their yeah. own, they make amps that you can mount outside, so you know you don't even have to come in now. Mm -hmm. um, bring try to retro the wires in the house, the military grade enclosures, the little fans on them. It's, it's uh, those speakers right there, Shane, that you're Thanks. showing Is on the top speakers? picture. Those are twenty grand a pair. But, oh I mean, God. they'll play like 120 dBs are insane for outside. For outside, yeah, yeah, built-in yeah. subs. <laughs> well, that, that part that you can see right now is normally covered, right? There's yeah, a, yeah, it's got a, a cover on it. They it. make them with whatever color you want. Wow, they make yeah. a multitude of different I think they're one of the better looking outdoor lines. Like that's yeah. one of the things that I think yeah, is kind of a problem yeah. is a lot of the outdoor stuff isn't great looking. So Shane, you see all these yes. like that's yeah, the kind of shit yeah. we do, these kind of crazy houses and yeah. you know what I mean? High end high end retail environments or art studios or whatever. I mean, that's a lot of what we do as integrators where people just want, you know, the best. They want to hide it. They don't want to see it. I will say Don, Don huh. probably more so than me, Don, I'm not picking on you when I say this, but mm -hmm. in a lot of the work we do too, we end up kind of riding on the coattail a little bit of the interior designers. So you show people pictures of your oh. work and like, oh my God, you did that. And it's like, well, I mean, that was well, the interior design. I mean, but... what are we going to, it's either walk up to a speaker in a, in a bush. You know what I mean? No, I so know. Whole, it's, I'm just saying yeah. you take pictures. The whole idea of this. that we do is to show the environment because people are visual and people of money our means want to look at something and go, wow, it's beautiful. And you're like, yeah, I'm able to get 118 decibels of crystal clear rock quality rock concert sound and a, a 200 inch projection screen that pops out of nowhere. And they're like, oh my God, I have to have that. But in order to do that, we have to kind of show the room um, and the environment that it's in. You know, we were on the cover of CE Pro 
it was the family room. It's not this. What, what, how else are you going to do it? You're going to go up to a TV and a no, speaker. No, no, you're and absolutely right. I'm just saying, yeah, like, you, you show these pictures yeah. of these beautiful but rooms right. and the no, reality is it's the work of the architect, the interior designer, oh, absolutely. the integrator it's together that effort. creates those beautiful spaces. We're a spoken I mean, word, I don't, man. I, I don't have the the talent and, and uh, taste to make some of those rooms that look like they do, but some really beautiful things have come together from things I've designed. Oh, Would, uh, badass. I mean, again, you have to do the photography on it. You know, you have to show people people are visual they want to see pictures of what, what you do and professional photography is the best way to do it are you would you say you guys are selective about what kind of rooms you put together like you say somebody came in and was like hey i got a i got a whole clip system i want to put in it's going to cost me cost them about five grand and then you get the next guy an hour later comes in i want to put a, together a hundred twenty thousand dollar system well we just We're, tell them what we charge then they, they yeah. like, <laughs> there, I mean, there's some truth to that. I, I mean, I mean we, that, there's a lot of truth to that. We're not, yeah, we have minimum engagement fees. There's just a cost it takes to get things done. And that tends to scare certain people. away. The other part of it is I'll just say, I'm too busy with the higher end stuff that kind of pays the bills to take on the smaller projects. Yeah, and I'd like right. to do more smaller projects to be honest, but there's, there's for me too much stuff going on right now in those bigger projects to, to bother. So if any married to those projects too, right, Matt? Yeah, well, I mean, they take like like Kellen said, big projects for I didn't know that until I started doing those just a couple of years ago. Uh, they just take forever. So and they come and go. That's yeah, the thing is because your role is kind of to a small niche part of the overall scope of the house being built or rebuilt or whatever they're doing to it, that they'll bring you in at the, you know, initial phase when they're just coming up with design stuff and you'll put a ton of hours into that. Maybe you put in I don't know, 40 hours into that. And then you disappear for a while, you know, because they go off and do all their stuff. They have to get permits and get other people involved. Then they come back to you and all right, we're ready. And we need the designs finalized by tomorrow. So you put in another hundred hours getting that done. And then you give them the design and then you don't hear from them again. And then all of a sudden they're like, all right, we're building. You need site inspections and you put in the hours oh, it's, again. It's, it's maddening, dude. I mean, we're going but, through that on a few projects together now, Matt. So to make it clear, Matt is an audio guy and loves it. If you walk into my family room, it's it's like a giant fucking boom box. I mean, like, right, right, Kellen? Like, yeah. you walk in, you're like, oh, <laughs> shit. You know what I mean? The, the massive speakers. I love this stuff. But professionally, that's kryptonite. I don't. Yeah, I, my I, wife I mean, I've would done, absolutely. My system built head into head a cabinet. Like God, I you that picture, Shane. We should do a show and tell one night sometime, but. I, I love it, but my clients would like, you want to put what? No way. So we have to do, you know, but I just put a $12,000 LCR sound bar on, underneath a 100 inch TV with all high end CIs and FIFA drivers in it, two JL 13 inch architectural subs. You walk in, you see a TV, it looks like it's a speaker on the TV, and you, and in ceiling surrounds, you fire it up, it rocks. It sounds amazing. But people go, sound bar? You know, yeah. it, but hundred is not TVs. not a normal soundbar. It's not a normal this, sound bar. This just gave me, you know, all three or four of us here. Me and Gene had this thing that we were gonna do, but Gene, I don't know, he chickened out. He didn't want to do it. I put out this post on the community. I said, "Listen, you guys send me your home theaters in a video, and every time, every week, we'll do a live stream. We'll watch your videos. We'll critique them as we go. That'd be cool." I'd love to do that. What, this is, would Gene, Gene all four of us will do that. I don't know what happened to Gene. Well, Gene's got a lot of stuff going on right now. Now, now wait, if we do this, do you want us to be like really brutal about this? Or do you want yes. us to be very polite? I started oh, this. Like, like roast my I started system. this. Yeah, this is basically a roast my system. I started this a couple years back on the other channel. Me and my buddy, we would get hammered and then just shit on everybody's speaker systems. Home theaters. <laughs> and uh, listen, you guys obviously don't have to shit on them. But... You know, like certain things that I, I personally don't like. When I see movie posters in your theater, I'm going to shit on that. Right. No, no. It's a little yeah. tacky. <laughs> sorry, guys. No, I yeah. agree. I'm sorry. It looks cool, but. I have, I have a few theater. lined up already. So the next time we get on, maybe next few days or so, um, I'll, line, them, I'll line up the videos and we'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> play the whole theater critique. Days. No, it'd be fun to do. I mean, I, I don't want to be brutal to anybody because look, man. No, no, no. You got to be brutal. Because every time you see one of these home theater tour videos, everybody's very, you know, But I'm polite. the biggest on YouTube and I don't want to be brutal. So, I mean, come on. <laughs> no, you got to be brutal. Well, and I think. But you know what? Be... Here's the deal. These dudes that. I'm sorry. Did I interrupt you, Kellen? I didn't mean to. Delay. Pose. 
but it was, it was me, but that's fine. Uh, I'm used to it. He's used to it. <laughs> Never mind. I'm going to shut up. Go ahead. Matthew Pose is way more profound. <laughs> I was just going to say, at the end of the day, I think all people's home theaters probably have various compromises. There's there's some people who yeah, make yeah, dumb yeah. decisions because they don't know better, but there's also people who made a decision. It was a conscious comp. I have, in my own house, both systems have conscious compromises made to them mm-hmm. that you could shit all over if you wanted to. There was a reason why it was done that way. You know, it was there was reasons it couldn't have been done a different way or, or you know, doing it a different way would have caused other problems, but... At the end of the day, that was the decision I made. Even in like really, really high end, like cost no object systems, we make sometimes decisions that from a distance they look stupid. But there was actually a reason behind the decision. It was a compromise. It wasn't the optimal way to do it, but it was what made sense. So I think there's like there's that. There's like things that aren't optimal, but you just didn't have another way to do it because of circumstances. And then there's And it just, doesn't matter. You know, Nobody will hear the difference, dude. Probably not, which is why they we make won't. those decisions. But then there are stupid decisions where people like, you know, like I, I, I mentioned that the left and right speakers mounted to the left and right wall of a room. That's a stupid decision. That's not where they go. <laughs> right. Oh, I dude, I, I'm on these forums, like the Focal Forum on Facebook. And these dudes will buy like grand utopias and shit and they'll have them right next to the wall point straight i'm like dude what are you doing <laughs> in thailand but what are you doing in thailand come on <laughs> on like, glass seriously. racks with windows and towel just floor. crazy like really they just throw money in at the wall and hope it's al dente you know what i mean are we like, wait are we allowed to make fun of things like headphone speakers please everything man everything. Dude, so you know i'm everything. changing this is like after this is Shane, <laughs> after hours, let your hair down. Well, Shane told me about this idea about about mounting speakers like right next to you, like this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for yeah. Headphones. And he said this is a good idea. I said, I don't, why would you? Do that? I didn't say I didn't say it was a good idea. Somebody had asked no, me you, if you it asked was a good me idea. if it was a good idea. Yeah, I got yeah. it. It's like fucking bass and surround. So for for what it's worth, I do not <laughs> think that that is a good idea, and I don't really understand the design intent. Uh, I understand it's supposed to be to recreate a headphone experience with speakers, but yeah, just put headphones on. <laughs> By Martin Logan. Well, you're not placing them on the left and right. It would be like right here. You would put your left and right speakers here. Did, if you had Martin you Logan, you'd, your you'd, stat, Jane, you'd place them right here. And feel like you had headphones on. Tell me, I know you did. Oh yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, you yeah, it's like, like dead center. Yeah. Like yeah, wow, yeah, but. You got to be right in the middle, playing the right kind of music with the right kind of setup. It's stars I mean, line. So, you know what kills to me? Say, People that use electrostats in their theater and are all proud of them, like, "Oh, look at my theater with Martin." Lund. I'm like, "Dude, really? Do you like to listen really low?" Is I mean, there somebody you're thinking about? I, no, one comes to mind. No, okay. I don't. There's just dude. All right. Okay. Wrong call on a theater speaker. Way wrong call. <laughs> Way wrong call. I mean, they so make surround I, speakers that you can mount on your wall, you know. They do, but well, sure they do. Of course, performance issues. For every, ask for every seat. The, the, a full electrostat surround system is wrong, unless you like to listen really low. Mm-hmm. And you don't want dynamics. You don't want bullets going by and explosions and shit. No matter how many subs you put in it. I mean, so I Shane, asked Andrew. I asked Andrew about that. I said, "Hey, you're on wall electrostat." Andrew, who? I was like, the guy from uh, Martin Logan. I was like, hey, I said, don't you they electrostats? Know. They, need, they, need, they need air to breathe, right? They're like, yes. I was like, hey, <laughs> yeah, your they electrostats are up against the wall. He goes, yeah. well, well, like, yeah, there's compromises, yeah. but it sounds fantastic. I they was like, okay. Yeah. I've been to their factory. They're amazing people. Hung out with them. Yeah. They know that shit, dude. It's just not a, it's not a theater experience. They're like, it sounds amazing. It's so open and spacious. I'm like, yeah. 88 dbs i mean come on <laughs> right so so guys i got it i think i gotta get going it's getting late oh, i gotta get up boy. early my yeah, kids yeah, have yeah. school i'm good but, for uh, you guys you guys can keep hanging on hey Matt. all right so we're gonna do this we're gonna do the theater critiques yeah i'm i'm open to this okay another, another night though i don't want these yeah. two nights yeah, yeah. not right now good. Good night. all right i'll see you guys all later night, all right later man Bye, boss telling you that Yo, so this is down dude. okay listen i've been wanting to do this with gene i started this when we, we used to get drunk and just shit on people's theaters well, he i'm not saying drunk. you guys got to shit on them but um yeah man we can make it interesting because every time i see a home theater tour it's just like <laughs> it's always like, Was like pissing on somebody for a fee or something i don't know <laughs> 
We should have pissed. Well, listen, you gotta be. You gotta be real. Like sometimes, like yeah, it's hundred bucks. There, to critique gonna, your theater. I'm gonna put a popcorn machine right next to my left speaker. All you, right. You know, it's not. Well, it's not okay. the people. It's some of these fucking influencers, man. That just drive me crazy with our. You gotta be at seventeen point four degrees and. Got to be here, and we're recalculating and reprogramming. I mean, fuck you, dude. Really, you're gonna tell people that shit and and make them, you know? Oh my god, I've got to have that because you know, so and so on fucking YouTube that lives in his mom's basement said so. Like, fuck you, dude. I'm not sure really? you're talking. About. I'm not sorry. sure you're talking not about. I'm not gonna. Anything, I'm not gonna comment on that. But I mean, but it, it people like on the edge of their seat and spending their money on this shit, dude. You know what I mean? Like, come on. Yeah. Yeah, that that's one of like the biggest frustrations that doing the rooms that I do in that ballpark price range, you know, less than twenty k. It's like how happy are yeah. those people though when they get their oh, flush? Dude, like that, that's they're, the main thing, they're right? Fucking thrilled! They're like, oh my god, this is amazing! I love you, thank you. Yeah, and you know what? You that's can, the best. You can do things bad, and it's like that. I think that's one of the biggest comments we get on our YouTube channel is like, why didn't he do acoustics? It's like well, he didn't he want to spend no money? money on acoustics. It's expensive. Had, yeah, he had this budget, and to do a seven two four, it's like, what, what do you do? Throw up two absorption panels, or just talk him into doing a <laughs> five four? You know, five one four. Next year at Christmas, and it's like, the next yeah, yeah, exactly. So, and uh, getting to get you know what I was gonna say is like going into a spec home where. You know, they had a low voltage crew pre wire it or something. They didn't, you know, contact or the up. electrician wire location. Like the well, it's it, it may not even be that bad, right? Like, yeah, the Atmos speaker should have went maybe six more inches to the left, you know, more narrow. And it's like, is it really worth moving the wire, paying a drywaller, come back in, fix a hole? It's like, there's half your budget and just you know the repair side of things so it's like sometimes no, it's true, you just man. gotta look it look, just makes me it upsets me back. that Step people a little are influencers project. that are influencing people to do dumb shit you know what i mean i'm not an influencer you're oh dude you're I'm just, I'm just maniac. Shame. Fuck, you're a fucking not an influence everybody's He's under the elite animal. <laughs> but you know what shane you give good advice <laughs> i respect what you do i am under the influence what? What did you say? What did you say, Shanley? All right, hold on. Like Let's cut it here. Then let somebody have something interesting to say. Tie very right white. Oh, you know what? How do you feel about dipoles and tripoles and uh, surround speakers? I mean, if I go in my time machine and go back, you know, twenty years, they were great. That's what I said, dude. People decorelization, you know, man. Right? <laughs> Remember that? There's still a band. Yeah, Everybody's who's gonna is are any of you guys gonna carry your Rindle speakers? They've they've just been blowing up the past. They're not I, letting nobody. They're not letting anybody know their shit, dude. Say I tried, but they're direct to consumer. Just like great Monster speaker, Price, great speaker for like, money. Yeah, yeah. They're they're still doing the whole trap hole thing uh, as they're surround. They're them. they're phenomenal speakers for the money, though. They really yeah are. For, for the price, yeah, for sure. No arguing. I mean, you're, um, eclipsed, you're eclipsed money for a real speaker. Sometimes you're limited to your roof rafters location. Yeah, this that's guy's, what I'm saying. This guy's in yeah. You've got an existing home. You want to build a killer surround system. And, you know, Joe Schmo online's like, you can't put those there. I mean, dude, you can, like yeah. one guy said, with digital calibration and room correction, you can do a lot with that if you're, speakers off remember speakers have a wide dispersion so if you're a few degrees off you're still covered in that man that that's just not true and I, I hate so many people so hyper focused on that it's just because Dolby says so well Dolby's talking about a freaking theater or a template of a room that you're built from the ground up yeah yes if we have the ability and the budget yeah. to build a house and a room from the ground up we're going to try to put everything in an ideal location for just sure. get a just get but, a trend off with 3D mapping, you're you're good to go. Yeah. You'll be all right. Yeah, that's doesn't mean I'm, you're wrong. Customers like I family... got a frame. I'm trying to figure out where to put. I got a vaulted ceiling. Where should I put my Atmos? Like, just get a trend off. <laughs> just get a trend off. That's it. Um. 
All right, let's uh listen. Shout out to all the people that all the hundred folks that hung with us. Oh, we got a hundred till like midnight tonight. So oh, we had thanks, five people. Thanks, thanks for that. Me. Thanks for all the guys Sorry at about uh, my harsh language mostly. Thanks to you guys who gave us super chats and the other ninety nine people that didn't give super chats, cheap asses. Uh, thank you for that. Um, if you guys want to sign up for uh, Patreon, listen, spare chain, not spare chain, shanelee.com, Patreon slash Shane Lee. If you guys want to sign up for Patreon, um, we offer discounts at uh, some of the dealers that we deal with. Um, I don't know if Jermaine is going to be on that list or not. We'll find out. And, and uh, if you want to sign up for, uh, for Patreon, for sign up for Patreon. It's a dollar a month, $12 a year. If you guys can't afford $12 a year. Seriously, guys, come on. You wrong guys. hobby. Yeah, you in the wrong hobby. You in the wrong channel. A uh, dollar a month, five dollars a month, ten dollars a month. If you really value the content that we put what out here on the channel, what does the dollar get you? Uh, dollar gets you. Uh, you know, you can DM me directly. So you, so really? Most people try to comment on my channels and ask me paragraphs and paragraphs or novels of questions mean. and what to do. I'm just gonna ignore them most of the time. I'm, just, I'm not gonna pay attention to it. Um, but listen, if you wanna. Join my Patreon for a dollar a month. You can ask me all the questions you want. I'll get back to you. If you want to get save some money on speakers, whatever, blah, 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 blah. I'll broker you a deal. Get yourself a new projector, home theater set up. Sign up on Patreon. We'll get that done as well. It's a dollar a month, $12 a year. Don't be fucking poor. Sign up for Patreon. If you really love me, $10 a month. Let's do it. But uh, definitely check out uh, Kellen at Dream Media. Uh, I think we're going to be working together hopefully in, soon in the future. Mad VR. I really want some Diablo speakers. Uh, that as well. Let's uh, let's make that happen. And, uh, you know, done, done. If you got uh, 100 grand and above, you want to put together your home theater, Don is the man. I'll take your money. And if, if, and if you don't have, you know, 90. <laughs> oh, man, you know, that's Look, man, it, you, know, you know what I have more fun with, though? Is people that don't have like mad money, like dude that works hard, you know, he's got a family, he's trying to put together a cool s system. He's it, listen, can you imagine just getting in this hobby and stepping into this turbulent, hurricane driven ocean of bullshit on home theater? It's out there and everything from Wired Magazine to this and to that. And you don't know what to do. You're like, bing, bing, bing. So you just grab onto something and hold on to it and yeah. hope that you're Those that you're right. sound bars are good. Do you think that's going to be just fine? I mean, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Digging on the knocking sound or not. bar. <laughs> Never heard it. It's probably, it might be great. You know? Yeah. Get so. three of them. Whatever, dude. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, guys. <laughs> like, share, subscribe. We'll see you in the Kellen, next video. Dude.